the record reflect we have reconvened with all members present. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance and remain standing after the pledge. I pledge allegiance. Again, remain standing. As we do at many of our meetings, we take time to remember longtime Madison residents who we lost over the last few weeks. Catherine Capon, the wife of the late Don Capon, our former police chief and mayor, passed away on January 9th at the age of 80. Born in Westwood, Massachusetts, Kathy was a graduate of Madison High School and Catherine Gibbs School. Proud homemaker, worked part-time as a bookkeeper and office manager. She was a member of the Rosary Society of St. Vincent. Kathy and Don were married for 60 years, and she was survived by her brothers and their spouses, her son Scout, Scott, his wife Colleen, daughter Kim, and her husband, former Madison Chief Tim Ehrenberg, daughter Donna and her husband Mark Lyons, also the grandmother of nine children and three great children. And for those that want to uh, remember uh, Catherine, please consider a donation to Alzheimer's New Jersey, 425 Eagle Rock Avenue, number 203, Ro Roseland, New Jersey. Mark Heller, the son of Madison resident uh, Martin Heller and the late uh, Margaret Heller died on January 17th. Due to complications at birth, Mark was born with irreversible brain damage. As shared in the obituary written by his father, Martin, Mark lived a life with great strength and fortitude and was able to show the character of generosity and giving, much like his parents. When Mark could no longer speak, he would write. And we, when he could no, long, no longer write, he listened and smiled. We also remember Alta Granado of Madison, passed away, um, surrounded by her family on January 10th. She's survived by her husband, lifelong Madison resident, Tom Granado, the owner of T&J Auto Service, who many of us know. She leaves one daughter, a son, four sisters, four grandchildren, three great-grandchildren. And Roy Muir, longtime Madison resident, passed away on January 9th, age of 91, survived by his children, Sharon, Beth, Craig, their spouses, nine grandchildren, his 15 great-grandchildren. Born in Michigan in 31, raised in Ironwood, Michigan, listed in the United States, served our uh, United States Navy, serving our country after high school and served four years. He returned to Ironwood and married the love of his wife, Nancy, in 1954. Worked in the pharmaceutical industry, uh, as initially as an independent pharmacist and Park Davis in 1979, came to Madison with Warner Lambert or Mars planes. And let us also remember the 11 killed in another census mass shooting this weekend. The 11 had gathered with friends and family on a day of celebration, welcoming the Chinese Lunar New Year. In a state of joy, the day ended in tragedy for 11 families, all because of another high-capacity weapon ending the lives of the innocent. So let's take a moment to remember Kathy Capon, Mark Keller, Alta Granado, Roy M M Mueller, and the 11. And let's pass our thoughts on to the families and friends that they leave behind. Thank you. Right, may I have a motion for the executive minutes of January 9th, 2023? So moved. Second. They've already been discussed. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Lost Tom. And a motion for the regular minutes of January 9th, 2023. So moved. Second. Any discussion or corrections? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Welcome all. And I appreciate your patience today as you had to wait for the doors to be uh, unlocked before entering the council chambers. As you may know, tonight is the uh, last night in five years that our original WFK Travers Lincoln portrait will be in the back of the room. Our next meeting will have a digital uh, 
replica. Uh, tomorrow, the portrait will be begin its journey to the National Portrait Gallery in the Smithsonian, in the um, Gallery of Presidents. And over the next five years, millions of visitors will be able to see this incredible portrait, which has been, been enjoyed by generations of Madison residents since the early 1940s. So it's like, uh, we, will, we will miss this great picture, but we will be graced with a replica. And again, it'll be a great honor for all of us as you go to uh, Washington, D.C. to stop by and uh, see Madison recognized in the uh, Port National Portrait Gallery. And this past Friday, we had an open house to allow the public not only to view the Lincoln portrait, but also to see the treasure that we have in Geraldine Rockefeller Dodge's gift to Madison, the Hartley Dodge Memorial that is this building. And I want to thank Michael in the back corner there for all his work in the event, including the signs that told the story of the portrait and turned this room into a museum for the day. And I want to thank the Hartley Dodge trustees who served as docents for the open house. It was, uh, to see the steady stream of uh, people coming through, not just from Madison, but neighboring communities. And for an update on the Drew Forest, um, as people may know that have been following this, uh, traditionally June is the deadline for applications to the Morris County Open Space Fund. A key requirement for the application is control of property, such as a contract purchase agreement. Drew was not ready to execute such an agreement last year, but with the Deadline looming, we have, I have sent a request to the attorney directly, that goes directly to the um, chairman of the board and the president of uh, Drew University to meet with us so we, we can get this conversation going now because we do not want to miss another round of fun grant funding from Morris County Open Space to secure the future of Drew University, to Drew Forest. Uh, university officials have publicly stated that they are committed to saving the forest. So I am optimistic that come next year's reorganizational meeting in early January, the Friends of the Drew Forest will be having a song of celebration. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, lastly, when we recognized uh, retiring volunteers at the reorganization meeting, we missed uh, two dedicated volunteers, Ellen Cranefuss and uh, Trina Malik. So this past Saturday, there was a, a gathering to recognize Ellen for her work with the Environmental Commission and Sustainable Madison Advisory Committee. So I was able to uh, present both Ellen and Trina with their Madison Borough medallions to recognize their many years of service uh, of work on the committee on behalf of the residents of Madison. And we'll go on to uh, reports from committees. Community Affairs, Council President Hoover. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, the Downtown Development Commission will hold its annual reorganization meeting on Thursday, January 26th at 7.15 in the Hartley Dodge Memorial Building Committee Room, second floor, which is right next door. Okay, the public is invited to attend. Second item, there is currently a survey regarding the Madison Farmers Market in circulation. You have yet to see it, but would like to participate Please email Lisa Ellis at ddc dot at rosenet dot org, and she will forward a link to complete the survey. The Chamber of Commerce, the 2023 Taste of Madison, is scheduled for Monday, April 24th. Information will be available shortly. From the Madison Community Arts Center, the Madison Community Arts Center is gearing up for the 2023 calendar. There are only 35 days when there have been no scheduled events. Over the holidays, a movie screen was installed at the center and plans are being made to set up a family series and a foreign film series. Currently on the walls at the center are our paintings by Maria Lupo, which will be on display until February 26th. This will be followed by a show entitled Don't Close Your Eyes, Ukrainian Artists Respond to the War a series of drawings and paintings by artists living in Ukraine. Other events will be planned around the show. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Just to reinforce the great our Arts Center, I was at the uh, MACA fundraising event yesterday where Jerry Veza and others performed. And uh, if you were there a year ago, it was uh, the room of uh, white um, 
and now it is it looks like a true art center the wainscoting the painting is incredible the blackout ceiling the new uh new lighting so it was a an amazing concert from uh local talent and uh, in an amazing location so thank you for sharing that and now um finance the borough clerk ms cohen thank you mayor um from the clerk march 27th is the deadline uh for anybody wanting to run in the primary in june uh, so make sure that you pick those up if you're interested in running. And also just a reminder that we do have the municipal ID program. It's still available through the clerk's office. The application is online and all you need are two forms of ID, one proving residency and one uh, that's a photo ID confirming your identity. Nothing else is needed. And then from the tax collector's office, we want to remind everyone that the first quarter property taxes are due in a couple of days on February 1st. Hartley Dodge is open, but because of the pandemic, property owners are encouraged to mail their payment or use the online portal system, which can be found on rosenet.org. From the finance department, we've already had multiple financial pre presentations over the last few months. Tonight, we are starting the budget process in earnest. This evening, we hear from the, about the financial performance of our water and electric utility. We will hear from Electric Utility Superintendent Jim Matina and the Public Works Director Ken O'Brien. We're blessed to have excellent, reliable, and safe electric and water services in Madison. Tonight you will hear about what steps our utility staff are taking to maintain and improve our distribution systems. As a reminder, the voting on the budget is one of the most important actions that Council takes. Our utilities build over 24.7 million, Jim? You left out a word. Million dollars in 2022. Our single largest budget line in the entire budget document is the procurement of electricity, which we buy and then distribute to our residents and businesses. As a council, we work hard to be transparent and to make information available to the residents. So tonight's the first of four budget presentations. The next one will be on February 13th, where we'll discuss the municipal budget as a whole. Um, leading up to on March 27th, we will have one final discussion of the budget along with the introduction of the official state budget document. As per state statute, we take a four-week break so that all residents have the opportunity to review that budget document. Then on April 24th, we are scheduled to have a hearing and vote to adopt the budget. As a reminder, all budget information is available on the annual budget process page on ROSENET. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Public Works and Engineering, Ms. Ehrlich. Thank you, Mayor. Tonight's budget will include, uh, budget's hearing will include public works, so I'll provide just a short update for this report. Tonight we'll be voting to confirm appropriations for the basketball pickleball court, the Cook Avenue parking lot reconstruction, and the Memorial Park footbridge repairs. We'll have a presentation on the Dodge playground redesign tonight based on revised plans and estimates, and stakeholder meetings will be scheduled to review the Waverly Place redesign concepts for which we've received some nice colored site plan renderings for review. The Department of Public Works reminds us that Christmas tree pickup continues until the end of the month. Please put your tree out on your regularly scheduled garbage pickup day to be shredded and mulched. And with a lack of snow this winter, Public Works crews are out in the parks blowing leaves and doing general maintenance. Trouble spots for sewer jetting have been cleaned and the borough will post again through social media when the next round of sewer lines will be cleaned this spring. DPW would like to remind residents not to dump grease or oil down the drain because it blocks our sewer lines. And the Shade Tree Management Board is preparing for the 2023 tree planting program. 130 trees will be ordered this year, with 70 to be planted in the spring and 60 in the fall. The RFP is out now to supply trees to the borough. Thank you. Thank you. Utilities, Mr. Landrian. Thank you, Mayor. From the Electric Department, on January 9th, the department had to disconnect and then reconnect the service at 56 Sampson so the electricity could, so the electrician could complete necessary electrical service repairs. On January 10th, the crew replaced the Victorian lamp posts um, on Lincoln Place with the new LED retrofit kits. On January 10th as well, the crew dug and set a new pole and anchor on Cook Avenue. They also dug and set a new pole on Ridgedale Avenue. The original poles had been damaged when a large tree came down across Cook Avenue as a result of the December 23rd windstorm. On January 17th, the department took down the Christmas tree on Waverly Place, chipped and then cleaned the area. The, they also removed all the holiday wreaths from the Victorian lamppost. Well, that tells me Christmas season is now over. It's done. It's official. 
On January 18th, our consulting engineer, Ed Jinks, gave a presentation to the entire department of the new relays being installed at our electrical substations. Ed was assisted by Joe Malone from Schweitzer Engineering and Jeffrey Spinney from American Electrical Testing. On January 18th, the borough received its new order of aluminum street light poles used on Madison Avenue. Uh, they had originally been ordered in May of 2022 when one of our poles had been damaged due to a car pole accident. And finally, on January 19th, the J department continued to work on in the garage reorganizing of their equipment and storing of the holiday wreaths. From the water department, the water department responded to Madison High School to shut down those six inch water main to the school so the maintenance department could make repairs to the water meter in the meter pit off Burnett Road. And finally, the water department also responded at Park Avenue address for an emergency water shutoff due to homeowners repair gone wrong. Unfortunately, the curb box at that address was damaged and would not operate. The department had excavated and repaired the curb box by the sidewalk in order to shut off the water to the residents. Consumers are, should always call the water department before starting any type of repair to make sure that the water can be controlled in case of an emergency. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Public safety, Mr. Range. Thank you, Mayor. I'm from the police department. Madison Police personnel attended the 2023 Law Day Symposium on January 20th at the Morris County Public Safety Academy. The symposium was held by the Morris County Prosecutor's Office and it was attended jointly by county uh, school administrators and staff. The training topics covered were school safety and security, threat assessments, gang awareness, and behavioral threat assessment management overviews. Madison officers present were police command staff, juvenile detective and school resource officers along with Madison school faculty and staff. The police department uh, accreditation assessment will occur during the next several months. We have been preparing for this large feat and ensuring that the depart all departmental policies are consistent with accreditation standards. This will be Madison's third reaccreditation, which occurs e every three years, which ensures we are following the best practices in law enforcement. And from the fire department, the ladder truck uh, continues to receive repairs, and we thank Chatham for providing ladder truck coverage. That's all tonight. Thank you. Thank you. And health, Mr. Howland Pudis. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> we held our first reorganization meeting on January 10th. We sworn in two new members. <coughs> Mitchell Horn, who was an interim member, is now sworn in for a three-year term. And Kevin McCarthy is now a new member of the Board of Health. Uh, we have a communicable disease review. The Mor Morris County's COVID activity level. My microphone, sorry. Is medium. Influenza activity across the state is moderate and seems to be relenting a bit. COVID infections are being driven by the XBB.1.5 variant, that is the most contagious variant so far. Bivalent bivalent COVID-19 booster and season influenza vaccinations are proven to reduce hospitalizations, severe disease, and death. These shots are available for free at the health department. Environmental, please don't forget to license your dogs and cats. Renewal can be done through the borough website. The health department will be conducting an animal census this summer to be sure that all eligible pets are licensed as per the borough code. Nursing. Free blood pressure screenings are available at the health department next to the borough clerk's office at Hartley Dodge Memorial on the third Friday of each month. No appointment is necessary. Health education. The health ed team is partnering with Atlantic Health to provide heart health programming at the Rexford Tucker Senior Housing on February 14th and February 24th. So if you didn't understand what I was saying about uh, getting any health screenings, the health department is now in this building on the first floor next to the tax collector's office. It's open five days a week. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Now we move on to communications and petitions. Uh, yes, Mayor. The Mayor and Council received emails from the following residents um, supporting a, uh, the appropriation for the basketball and pickleball courts. We received an email from resident Matt Fashnot, Katie Hearn, Kelly and Pat Deenan, Douglas Eilander, Ingrid uh, Petrak, Janine Horsey, David DePaul, and Peter Boyd. Thank you. 
We now move on to our first of two invitations for public comment. This one is limited to items that are on our discussion list and also resolutions. So I will go through those items and those are the only items you can comment on right now. We will have another um, discussion period later and there's also ordinances that will have a hearing when you can comment on those. So um, I'm guessing that there may be some people here to uh, comment on the cannabis uh, ordinances. This is not the time and you will not be permitted to comment on that. Each of the ordinances will have a hearing when you can comment on those. Uh, if you want to comment on these items I will list, you will step up to lectern, state your name, your address, and write the same on there. Then state the agenda item you are commenting on or the resolution, and then try to start your comments. Try to limit to three minutes, but we do give you a one-minute grace period. We end you, at, you end at four minutes sharp. So these are the items you may comment on. The Climate Action Committee report, and this is our findings report. Dodge Field Playground update. The uh, budget hearing on the electric utility, water utility, and public works. And these are the resolutions you may co comment on. These are also part of our consent agenda at the end of the meeting, so you're aware of what's in there. Resolution 51, authorizing uh, award and payment of amount of $39,774 to persistent construction for footbridge repairs at Memorial Park on an emergency basis. Uh, resolution 52 is authorizing final payment and change order request amount of $196,246 for Hartley Dodge Memorial Plaza restoration uh, completed by Merrill uh, Garaguso. That is funded through Ordinance 5, 2023. The previous resolution is funded through Ordinance 6, 2023. We have uh, Resolution 53 is authorizing the final payment and change order with Clark Caton Hints for professional services regarding the Hartley Dodge Memorial Plaza. And this is an um, additional amount of $7,500 for a consolidated amount of $9,400, and this is funded through Ordinance 56 2016 and Ordinance 14 2018. Resolution 54 is approving salary increase for Elizabeth Osborne. Salary uh, moves from $106,956 to $117,000, effective 1123. Resolution uh, 55 approving temporary signs for the Thursday Morning Club. Uh, February through uh, May, and again July through September. Resolution 56 is authorizing an annual stipend of $3,000 for Francis Boardman for assuming additional duties to implement enforced tree protection permit process. Resolution 57 is approving use of the community pool parking lot by the adult school at Chatham's Madison Florham Park on April 13th, May 3rd, and May 18th. Resolution 58 is authorizing continuation electric utility rebate program in 2023 and this is uh, anticipated will be less than uh, seventy thousand dollars information for this is on the website resolution 59 is authorizing withdrawal from medical prescription drug plan offering uh, offered under the state uh, health benefits program of state of new jersey effective march 31st you've probably heard quite a bit about the increases in the state plan so we have uh, found a much uh, more economical plan, so we are announcing we're withdrawing. And related, Resolution 60 is authorizing participation in North Jersey Municipal Employee Benefits Fund, so that's where the new health insurance program will move to. Resolution 61 is amending Resolution 149, 2022, awarding a contract to Nielsen Ford for purchase of two hybrid police vehicles and accessory equipment. Um, and uh, this is going to be uh, moved to um, and getting 2024 models and um, or 2023 models and not to exceed $81,700. And Resolution 62 is approving raffle license for the Covenant House of New Jersey. So you may comment on those resolutions or the three discussion items I mentioned. If you want to comment on those, please step forward. And when you get to lectern, state your name, ad address, and state the agenda item you are commenting on. Okay. Uh, I'm Bruce Essrig, and I live at 28 Bedford Court in Madison. Um, I have not had a chance to read the Climate Action Committee report, but I did want to speak briefly in favor of Madison taking action with regard to climate. 
So with uh, regard to that, um, I am aware that uh, carbon dioxide concentrations have been increasing in the atmosphere. I would be glad to go over the details with anyone who is interested. It, this chart runs from 1750 to the present. And also, um, temperatures have been increasing in the atmosphere. This chart runs from 10,000 years before the present till the present. Uh, the significant thing to know is that in the past, the climate has been warmer by about four-tenths of a degree centigrade than it currently is in the recent historical period. Um, the current historical period, we have exceeded that, and we're on a trend to go higher. This temperature in the past caused moisture, for example, in northern Africa. There were climate impacts. We seek in Madison to take steps to limit the extent to which the Earth heats because we believe that it will have an effect on the climate. Um, I can tell you more about all of these things, but I will take my time like that. Thank you very much. Anyone waiting to write the name down on the sheet? Yes. Please. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to comment on the agenda items or the res any resolution? Good evening. I'm Lisa McAllister. I live at 39 Wayne Boulevard. Hi, everybody. Um, just uh, like this gentleman, I wanted to speak in support, and uh, you know, I don't pretend to be any kind of expert on on climate change, but I know that um, what struck me over the last year has been the number of moms chat groups. I have a middle schooler in town, and you know, this constant commentary on the weather, the weather, the weather, this weather's crazy, this, you know, and I, I feel like we have already passed some point at which we can't be surprised by extremes in weather, but we can set an example for other communities, and I think you know, we're really lucky here to have people who have vision and expertise and can, can guide us toward uh, doing our part and maybe starting something in the surrounding communities to, to really be proactive about climate change, so. Um, I, I have a lot of confidence in you all and the architects of the plan, and I hope that, that we can adopt it and move forward as a community. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to comment on the agenda items? Hi, I'm Yamaki Nasruk. Uh, I live at 28 Bedford Court. Um, in Madison Commons, and I also um, am very happy to hear that Madison is taking uh, action with regard to climate, um, sort of doing what we can to reduce uh, our trajectory towards climate disaster. Um, I think that we're a town that is um, that has resources, both you know, financial and intellectual resources, that not every town has. And I think that what we do matters not only because we have the impact that we have, but because we can also um, provide some sort of example, um, provide some sort of uh, resources in terms of learning, in terms of planning. Um, and, and so I think it's very important that we as a town take leadership, looking at this beautiful painting and so on, it's, it's, it's a kind of sign that, that as a town we really do have things that are of national, can be of national significance that we can have an impact. So I'm very excited about that and hoping that we can all support it. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to comment? Hi everyone, uh, Rachel Kirk on Niles Avenue. Um, I just want to quickly bring up, I know that our neighborhood has specifically brought up the playground situation. I don't have kids personally, so I'm not quite in that boat yet. Um, but I know that a lot of moms are concerned about the playground at Del Barton. And I know, I know Deborah, you're gonna give a presentation. I'm not sure what that's gonna look like, but there was talks about, and I think a commitment to making sure that some of the equipment that's gonna be replaced at the other park gets potentially reused at Del Barton. I just want to make sure that that is spoken to and thought about. Um, our park looks like a scary 80s movie. Um, so it would be great if we could get some more resources out there. Um, and there's a ton of flooding and 
I know a bunch of trees just got cut down, so I'm sure that there's some plans. I just, I'm not sure the total plan. I just wanted to bring that up. Thank you. So, are you addressing that, Deb? Thank you. Anyone else wishing to comment on agenda items? My name is Alan Swanson. I live at 47 Overhill Road Summit. But I'm here tonight as the chair of the Lawanica Group of the New Jersey chapter of the Sierra Club, which represents uh, nearly all of Morris County and almost all of Union County. Um, I'm also a member of the uh, New Jersey chapter executive committee and chair of their communications committee across the state. I'm here to congratulate you. Um, I frequently bring up Madison uh, as an example of what communities should be doing to address the issue of the climate crisis that we're currently in. You need to know that there are leaders and communities out there who, when I have spoken at this kind of a meeting, have said to me that climate change is not a local issue. My reply to one mayor not long ago was when the cars were floating down the normally two-inch stream during Ida, was that not a local issue? That mayor was spent a lot of time boasting about the emergency response that the, the local um, fire department and police had done for that crisis in the town. The citizens of Madison are, are extremely fortunate to have you as their leaders and to have you as concerned about the issue of climate action as you are. I'm fortunate that I happen to be the chair of the group that represents Madison because it gives me the opportunity to go to the state, to go to other communities, and to, to use Madison as the example of what we need to be doing across this entire state. Right now, there are people in the Lawanka group, and I'm pushing for people at the state level to be using Madison as the example of what we need to do across the state to address the issue of climate change at the local level. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to comment on agenda items? I'll put my name down. You good? Hi, I'm Jennifer McCann. I live at 16 Maple Avenue, Madison. I'm also here tonight to voice my support for the Climate Action Committee report. Um, at a time when it's clear that there needs to be more done on a global level to address climate change and global warming, I'm really thankful for the work of the Climate Action Committee and I'm proud to live in a town like Madison that is making local change and hopefully will influence other communities to do the same. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else wishing to comment? Seeing none, I close this part of the meeting, and we now move on to agenda discussions. And the first one is the aforementioned uh, Climate Action Committee report. Rachel. In my new seat across the council chamber, it seemed a bit awkward to present from my seat and have everyone directed to look at the slideshow, so I'm going to present from the lectern tonight. <clears throat> okay. I'll begin with the context for this climate action plan and why this is a unique moment in time and place for us to act. The Inflation Reduction Act, signed into law last August by President Biden, cuts U.S. emissions by making clean energy cheap 
through tax credits and other incentives that will make it easier for households, businesses, state and local governments, and utilities to electrify and to adopt clean energy, clean fuels, and clean vehicles. It is the largest investment in clean energy ever made by the federal government with unprecedented funding to build out a low carbon grid. It will be and is already becoming the greatest spring of job creation and economic competitiveness in the 21st century. Huge investments into clean technologies are already flowing to the US. Private companies have invested north of $100 billion in EVs, battery factories, charging infrastructure, and solar. Hardly a week goes by now without another multi-billion dollar announcement in the U.S. So, now states have a generational opportunity to both implement and build on the federal climate action that we saw in 2022. 2023 needs to mark the beginning of an era of accelerated state and local climate leadership. We are moving into a period of rapid deployment where state houses and town halls like ours have access to money and programs to make real change possible. But possible is distinct from actual, and the difference will rely on who acts. It's now up to the American people how much the federal government invests in our clean future. If everyone gets a heat pump, an EV, and solar panels in this decade, the U.S. government will invest far more in the transition from carbon power to clean power than the $370 billion quoted in news articles about the IRA. Given the current political landscape at the federal level, action at the state and local level is critical for engagement and deployment. The federal government may exert many times more control over emissions than a town does, but our actions add to or deplete the same carbon budget. Any emissions reduction anywhere in any sector counts as progress towards the same goal. To acknowledge that everything is connected is to acknowledge that our actions have consequences and therefore responsibilities we must be willing to shoulder. The solutions to climate change require cooperative work at all levels, from local energy transition to national policies that stop subsidizing fossil fuels to international agreements to set emissions goals. The world has never been doing more to reduce emissions, but it's still not enough to avoid unsafe levels of global heating. The 2020s are the critical decade for climate action, and we are more than 25% through already. So we must consider what power we have to act and use that power to do more. Activists and scientists have been saying for a long time that we are in a dire situation that, will, that de demands profound change. We cannot avoid escalating warming. It's here and more is locked in. But we still face choices that will determine how much warmer it will get. Two degrees Celsius, three degrees, four. Every sliver of a degree of warming that we prevent will save lives and avoid catastrophic damage. Stability and the status quo are not options because everything is changing dramatically. We cannot survive and adapt to the world we have created without change. And that change is here now. It needs to be more and faster, but it is underway. Communities across the country and here in New Jersey are acting. We all have different reasons to care, but the bottom line is to care about climate change, you only need to be one thing, and that's a person living on planet Earth who wants a better future. I know that we here are all that person, and so is everyone we know in our great town and beyond. The climate crisis requires us to understand that we are the same, that we are all at risk, and that we must work together worldwide, nationwide, and here at home to act and save ourselves. Madison first committed to acting a year ago in January 2022 with the adoption of Resolution 38. Next slide. Resolution 38 has four key points. To reduce greenhouse gases, to strengthen our communities by increasing resiliency, to support New Jersey state goals for energy and resiliency, and to pilot the climate action process. So with these four goals in mind, the Climate Action Committee was formed to implement a one-year pilot program in 2022. The committee identified two primary goals for this pilot. One was to develop a framework for this recurring climate action process. And the second was to identify near-term climate actions that the borough can consider to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and improve resiliency. Next slide. 
So these two goals resulted in two reports, the 2022 Climate Action Report and the 2023 Climate Action Recommendations. The 2022 Climate Action Report is a one-time report that presents the findings of the Climate Action Pilot Program. It contains long-term climate goals for Madison to adopt, and it forms a 30-year path to get us to 2050. It also describes a recurring climate action process to measure progress towards those climate goals. The 2023 Climate Action Recommendations is a report to be updated each year, and it includes actions the borough can take to meet those goals. So it includes actions that will take approximately 12 to 18 months to pursue and explore, and those support the long-term climate goals in the Climate Action Report. To be clear, tonight's presentation is focused on the 2022 Climate Action Report, and we will address the Climate Action Recommendations uh, on February 13th in Part 2 of this presentation. Next slide. So climate action is Madison's response to New Jersey state mandates to reduce emissions and adapt to a changed climate. New Jersey has identified climate change as the defining issue of our time and has enacted ambitious legislation to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and help communities adapt to a changing climate. New Jersey's energy master plan sets forth the least cost path to reducing greenhouse gas emissions 80% by 2050. It also established that community level action is necessary to achieve the state's goal of 100% clean energy by 2050. Now, because we are already living in a changed climate, resiliency planning tools have been developed to help towns adapt to rising temperatures and increasingly frequent and severe storms. So these plans are what help Madison uh, adopt and create long-term climate goals. They're all derived from New Jersey's state goals. Next slide. Madison's climate goals include eight energy goals supporting that 80 by 50 goal, including our top level goal, which is Madison's 80 by 50 emissions goal. That goal is to decrease Madison's total carbon footprint by 80% from 140,000 tons of carbon dioxide in 2018 to 28,000 tons by 2050. This 80 by 50 goal drives supporting goals for all the sources that contribute to our footprint, which are outlined in this chart. So it, it drives two transportation goals, four goals for our energy supply, and one goal for building energy. So this chart depicts the emissions from fuel burned within Madison. So that's for all vehicles and the building systems that heat air and water. The blue depicts the vehicle emissions. That's the, um, you can see it's the largest and it varies quite a bit. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. The red shows emissions from fuel burned uh, to heat the air and water in our buildings. There's a thin green line there that represents the heating oil that is burned, similarly for building systems. And the purple represents the emissions from fuel burned to supply our electricity wherever that generation may take place. So some key observations from this figure. The dominant contribution to our footprint is from the use of fossil fuels in buildings, that's red, and vehicles in blue. The contribution from the generation of our electricity is low for all the years shown here, 2018 to 2021, because much of the power, the electricity in New Jersey is nuclear generated. So the variations that you see in this chart every six months in the electric contribution are due to changes in the borough's electricity contracts. And that large dip in 2020 and 2021 has two causes. Vehicle travel decreased because of COVID. And secondly, in this period, as it happens, our electricity came from companies that were even more heavily nuclear and less fossil genera generated. So this is the total footprint that we seek to decrease to 20% of its current value by 2050. And to measure progress in specific areas, we need metrics and goals for the different sources that contribute to the total footprint. Next slide. These are the two goals uh, for transportation. The first goal here is for the municipal fleet. The chart on the left is for all the vehicles in Madison, and I'll come to that figure in a minute for the second goal. So the borough operates a fleet of 36 non-emergency light-duty vehicles. The proposed goal is that by 2025, EVs should contribute 25% of municipal fleet mileage. The goal rises to 100% of mileage by 2035, and these percentages are based on goals for the state fleet that are set forth in New Jersey's plug-in electric vehicle law. The second goal is for the total number of vehicles in Madison. New Jersey has set a statewide goal of having 330,000 plug-in electric vehicles by 2025. 
So if we extrapolate Madison's percentage of that number, we get 1,200 total plug-in electric vehicles in Madison by 2025. We currently have about 300 according to NJDEP registration data that's shown in the blue line on this chart. The blue line, I'm sorry, the purple line on this chart, the blue line shows a path set in 2019 to reach that goal of 1,200 vehicles by the end of 2025. The state has a, a statewide goal for PEVs, which is 2 million vehicles by 2035. And I'll note here that this goal is only set to 2020, uh, I'm sorry, I misspoke, 2 million vehicles by 2035. And the future goals for Madison leading out that far will, will be developed uh, in the next couple of years. Interestingly, Madison has been ahead of the statewide curve in terms of early adoption. And so we have a goal set to 2025 and we will revisit this in the next two years as we approach that goal and track our progress towards the, the 1,200 vehicles uh, that we've set for the 2025 goal. Next slide. Okay, these are our four climate goals for energy supply. The first energy supply goal deals with our purchase power. This is the power that Madison buys off the grid and distributes to Madison Electric customers. As Deb mentioned, this is the largest budget item in our municipal budget. New Jersey's statewide goal uh, for renewably sourced electricity is expressed in what's called the Renewable Portfolio Standard. And each year that RPS slightly increases the required percentage of renewable power for electricity supplied in the state. In 2022, Madison's renewable content for our purchased electricity exceeded the RPS requirements and we've met or exceeded that standard for some time before that. So the proposed goal is that Madison should continue to meet or exceed the statewide standard for renewable content in our purchased electricity. The next two goals address power locally that is generated locally here in Madison. We currently have between 85 and 100 homes with rooftop solar out of about 5,000 residences. Today, this supplies about 1% of Madison's annual electricity consumption. And the proposed goal is that 1,000 Madison residences have rooftop solar by 2050. The next goal addresses other solar generation sources in Madison. If much of the potential for solar was developed at municipal facilities, schools, and commercial buildings, this would total nearly 10 megawatts of generating capacity, which would produce about 12 gigawatt hours of an energy annually. This is equal to about 5% of Madison's projected electricity demand in 2050. And so that's how we reach this proposed 5% goal for non-residential solar generation. So if there's questions about how these target numbers were calculated for the two solar energy items, I'm happy to give more detail on how we arrived at those figures. An important point related to these in-town generation goals with regard to solar is that as solar installations in Madison increase, we must adopt a supportive rate structure. The tariff has to be fair to solar and non-solar customers. It has to be supportive of solar infrastructure as well as the financial health of the utility. And it has to be balanced for large and small customers whether they adopt solar generation or not. For the last energy goal, we must equip, equip the grid to maintain high reliability while staying ahead of growing infrastructure demands due to electrification and increased solar generation. We in Madison know that we enjoy a very high level of service and reliability from our utility, and it's critical that the borough continually meet new demands on our grid without compromising that reliability, which we so value. Next slide. <clears throat> the final energy goal addresses emissions from buildings. That was the red bar on the chart we saw for Madison's carbon footprint. Today, space and water heating in Madison is nearly 100% gas-fueled. The gas burned in buildings, primarily to heat the air and water, accounts for 28% of New Jersey's greenhouse gas emissions, <clears throat> and the percentage is even higher in Madison based on our energy carbon footprint. New Jersey's 80 by 50 report outlines a state goal for electrification of 90% of space and water heating. As the furnaces, boilers, and gas-fired hot water heaters that, are, uh, that we have currently in buildings are replaced at the end of their service life with high-efficiency electric heat pump equipment. The goal for Madison then follows the New Jersey goal to reduce our, by 2050, our use of fossil fuels for space and water heating by 90% to a level of 1 million therms for all Madison buildings. So the two figures on this chart show Mad Madison's total gas consumption from 2018 to 2021. 
and they propose a goal curve that goes out to 2050 based on that 90% gas reduction goal for New Jersey. In the top chart, gas consumption is shown separately for residences, which is the yellow bar at the top, and it also shows municipal, commercial, which includes schools, and industrial buildings. In the lower chart, we take the little sliver of blue that you can just see at the bottom there that represents municipal gas usage in the top figure, and we expand it to show how the borough's annual gas bill from PSE&G is apportioned to different buildings in the municipal uh, portfolio. So you can see Hartley Dodge there in blue is probably the biggest consumer of gas for heating and hot water, um, followed by public safety building and other uh, buildings and, and smaller uh, projects throughout the town as well. So the New Jersey Energy Master Plan acknowledges that since heating and hot water equipment have really long service lives, in order to meet that 2050 goal, Sales of new heating and hot water units must shift rapidly to the new heat pump technologies, reaching approximately 75% of total sales by 2030. And we also see from these charts that while gas usage by a borough-owned building is just a sliver of Madison's total gas usage, electrification of municipal buildings still sets an important example and will save the borough money as fossil fuel costs continue to rise. Next slide. Madison Climate Goals also include resiliency goals for climate adaptation, which are based on New Jersey State Resilience Goals. The goals proposed for Madison, which will help our community adapt to an already changed climate, are to decrease the effects of increased precipitation and stormwater, mitigate increased temperatures, identify and address social vulnerabilities, and to strive for health equity. These goals are generally more qualitative than the energy goals, the recommendation is that the borough's resiliency enhancing activities should be assessed against these four top level goals. So for reference, some examples of ongoing resiliency actions in Madison include implementing green infrastructure to recharge our aquifer and reduce surface flooding, and to grow our tree canopy to reduce the heat island effect. I'll just take a point to talk about why health equity is included here. It should be pointed out that disadvantaged members of our community, which includes over 600 individuals living at or below the poverty level in Madison, are socially vulnerable and they are disproportionately <coughs> impacted by climate threats. And that's why New Jersey state goals elevate the need to strive for health equity and address those who are disproportionately impacted by changed climate. Next slide. So those 12 climate goals that I went through very quickly, as quickly as I could, form the bulk of the 2022 Climate Action Report. And the report concludes with these two recommendations. The first one is to adopt these 12 energy and resiliency goals to form a 30-year path to aligning Madison with New Jersey State climate goals. And the second is to implement the Climate Action Process, which is an annual measurement and reporting process to be conducted by the Climate Action Committee this will help us gauge progress towards those goals and propose actions to meet them. So the proposed climate goals, as noted in the first key point here, are not fixed rules. They are conceived of as a flexible framework to guide the borough in incorporating climate action into the planning and decision-making process. The precedent here for this approach is the borough's strategic planning initiative and the budget guidelines that came out of it. Those guidelines are used each year by the CFO and by the council to evaluate the borough's municipal budget prior to adoption. I'll share this statement from the budget, budget committee's recommendation that was issued back in 2015. It summarizes the function of the budget guidelines, but it applies equally well to the proposed climate go goals. It states, the guidelines should not be considered as hard and fast rules that cannot tolerate exceptions. Rather, they should be seen as firm but flexible and to be complied with over the long term with any material deviations publicly disclosed and explained as part of the budget process. Through the climate action process in recommendation two, in which I'll describe on the next slide, the governing body and the administration would have an opportunity to examine progress towards the climate goals, weigh the priorities for planning and investment each year, and decide on the most prudent course of action. Next slide. So this figure describes the recurring climate action process. It starts with measurements and reporting progress towards the climate goals. And then based on those findings, which we reported to the council and the public, the committee would work with borough staff and department heads to develop new actions to help us stay on track to meet those goals. 
and then proposed actions would be reviewed and fine-tuned with the administration and then presented to the governing body and the public for adoption prior to the next year's budget cycle. Next slide. So to give you a preview of the presentation on the 13th and to help illustrate how the process would work, here we highlight some of the 2023 climate action recommendations ahead of the next presentation. I won't read them, but two of these recommendations are about establishing a plan to replace gas burning vehicles in the municipal fleet and gas burning equipment in the municipal buildings. The idea here is to plan ahead and replace with money saving high efficiency electric versions as the current vehicles and building equipment reach the end of their useful life. Another recommendation here is, is to develop an outreach program that would help residents and business owners make a similar plan to what the borough would do to move to high efficiency electric equipment for their homes and businesses as their equipment and vehicles reach the end of their service life. We also have several resiliency goals. Here we mentioned adopting a, a water conservation ordinance and completing a community equity and diversity profile, which is an activity divine, defined by the state organization Sustainable Jersey. Next slide. Okay, so next steps. Uh, the discussion of the climate action recommendations will continue at February on the February 13th agenda. There will be a vote on a resolution to adopt these climate goals and the climate action process that we presented tonight. And there will also be a vote to pursue recommended climate actions for 2023. A regular committee would be formed to implement the climate process and the actions adopted by council. And a really important uh, feature and function I want to highlight here is that the committee would do outreach to help other New Jersey towns adopt a climate process so that we can magnify the impact of what Madison is doing here and help more towns align with New Jersey's statewide energy and resiliency policies like we are striving to do here. So in closing, I want to reiterate that this is a 30-year framework to guide decision making with goals that for the most part take us out to 2050. And just as our strategic guidelines for the municipal budget give us guardrails and goals for the governing body and administration to assess our budget priorities each year, these climate goals form a pathway to 2050 with a framework that will guide us to a safe, healthy, and resilient future. Next slide. So I moved through tonight's slides pretty quickly to summarize the report. I want to refer everyone to the full 2020 Climate Action Report, which will be posted on Rosenet tomorrow. I'm happy to answer any questions uh, from the council tonight. But before I do that, I just want to offer a heartfelt thank you to the Climate Action Ad Hoc Committee. Many of those members are here tonight. Uh, Kathy Cacavalli, Peter Freed, Mary Ellen Hennessy Jones, Lisa Jordan, and Kirsten Wallenstein, Wallenstein. I want to thank you for your hard work on this project, your commitment to the sometimes tedious and certainly um, very exacting work that we undertook, and for your vision of a safe, healthy, and resilient Madison. I know I speak for the council, the mayor, and the administration in recognizing the incredible amount of very professional work produced by you all over the last year. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. So uh, Rachel, um, thank you for your leadership on, on this. And uh, again, to the whole committee, it's incredible. Uh, amount of information and well thought out uh, report and we look forward to the uh, recommendations on our on our next meeting as you already mentioned I saw you know I, I was watching people taking picture of the slides that this will be posted on rosenet.org so you can see the full report and uh, look at, at, at your leisure um, a key thing before I ask for some more comments from the council is this we're, we're not operating in a vacuum you were guided by the statewide goals and that's and um, we have seen that on the local level, things happen faster. People get frustrated sometimes, as I look at Dutch in the back corner, sometimes how things work locally. But believe me, it works faster on the local level than it does at the county or even more importantly, state and federal level. So this is why we need to make a difference. As uh, Rachel is working on this, I said that this is what makes this valuable is not keeping this to Madison, but sharing this, as has already been pointed out. So we've already got plans to make sure that we can, um, I'm hoping to have this as a workshop at the League of Municipalities uh, conference in uh, no November to, sh to share the great, this great work. So thank you again, and uh, you are uh, creating a legacy for the future generations here. 
Thank you, Mayor. Comments and Bob? Yeah, uh, first of all, Rachel, I want to thank you and the committee for taking this on. You know, it's one thing to be interested in something like this. It's another to be passionate about it. And I can say from the bottom of my heart, you're all passionate. And I've seen you come to meetings on a bicycle. <laughs> uh, you know, it says something about you and your committee. Um, I, had the for I had the honor of speaking with you before this. And I know a lot of what we talked about may come out in future reports, you know. Um, but one thing I did note is that the long-term goal is 2050. Well, hopefully I'm around to see it. You know, God only knows. But what I can tell you is this. I think right now we're kind of at a tipping point. I can remember growing up in Brooklyn. Soon after Thanksgiving, there was snow on the ground. I'd say, Mom, I'm going to Prospect Park to go sleigh riding. We've now had over 320 days of no snow in New York and continuous flooding in California, followed by a mega drought. So if people don't think that this is for real and it's not affecting us now, it sure as hell is. So thank you for taking this on. Thank you, Bob. Okay. Other uh, comments, questions? Tom? Rachel, you know what? Oh, sorry. Phone. I do speak loud, though. I, I did know what Councilman Landry Landrian said about all your efforts and your committee. It's fantastic. And uh, we probably are going to be a role model for the state for climate co climate action committees. And, and to put it simply for the borough, for some of the residents to even understand the benefits we're going to have long term, there will be financial benefits, a lot of health benefits. If we do move to electrify more, it's an opportunity once we improve our infrastructure for the borough to actually have revenue and move us using gas and oil and sending that money to other utilities to pay for the same services, we can do it more efficiently in town, uh, cleaner, <clears throat> and we could also benefit a little bit from the money the electric utility makes. And we're going to have a lot of new um, uh, services that we're going to install, hopefully, in the borough in the next, in the coming future with, with your guidance, too, and, the, and also with the borough's enthusiasm. And hopefully the residents appreciate what's going on too so thanks very much for all your efforts thanks tom tom i want to highlight a question you had for me when we spoke about this plan i don't think i got back to you you asked if a household purchases a plug-in vehicle that is a plug-in electric hybrid to popular model these days so that people have the plug-in capacity and they have a small tank of gas for backup power does that count towards madison's proposed goal of 1200 electric vehicles by 2025 and yes, as long as it gets plugged in and you're charging your battery from the grid, it counts towards that goal. So I think you know many households will see that kind of vehicle as a bridge to full electrification. And because it's plug in and has a battery that's charged from the grid, that would count. So I think that'll be a boon for us. Good. Thank you. Other questions and comments? Eric? Uh, Rachel, again, thanks for your work on this. And, you know, I just want to say what strikes me about all of this is that it's rooted in data and rooted in, in science. Um, and the actions here can be measured and we can see how we're doing and how we're progressing. Um, and, you know, we have to have lofty goals. We won't always meet them, probably, because um, that's just the nature of life. Um, but I think with lofty goals, even if we fall a little short, that's okay sometimes. Um, so I look forward to seeing the full 2023 recommendations and how we can start um, putting this into practice. But I think to your point, uh, having the budget strategic plan and those guidelines being sort of a beacon uh, for this process um, and how well that served us. I think this will serve us equally, if not better, than the, that process. So thanks so much for putting this together. Thanks, Eric. You know, an important point is that the goal curves that are shown in these figures depict a nice smoothly dropping or a smoothly ascending curve. And that represents a goal to get us to 2050. We know that in reality, there may be steps or jumps. We may miss a year. We may beat the, tr the curve one year. And that's just the reality of the vehicles that we replaced that year or you know, changing over the DPW garage old model boiler to a heat pump system one year. Uh, so it will probably not proceed in a smooth curve. But the idea is that over time, 
if we track against that curve uh, to get to 2050, which is the New Jersey state goal, with those um, overall arching, overarching goals, we will have done a tremendous part to participate in supporting the climate goals for the state. And so it's not necessarily about year over year how we do, but if we get to the goal in the end. Any other comments or questions? The only thing I want to emphasize again, we've heard some of the importance about this. You also talked about uh, health equity. Um, I saw a very telling uh, presentation where it showed a New Jersey map of the areas with uh, heat island effect, and which is pretty much the communities that don't have trees. It's the city areas that are hotter during the summer. And then if you overlaid the poverty rate onto that map, it was almost identical. And it shows where the last century, where our country has gone, you know, and if you overlaid on top of that asthma, it would probably be about the same. So it, it, this is so important, not just for the um, overall saving of our planet, but the air we breathe. That's right. Environmental equity is a huge part of adaptation and climate goals. And so we wanted to be sure that was a, a part of Madison's goal as well. I know we uh, don't think necessarily about um, disadvantaged folks in our community because it's a relatively small percentage of our affluent town, but it's important to understand that they are disproportionately impacted by increasing temperatures and increased risks of flooding, and uh, that needs to be part of our plan to address that. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you again. We look forward to the recommendations at the next meeting. Thank you. All right, Dodgefield Playground update. Thank you, Mayor. Um, one of the things that I, I will tie into to Rachel's presentation is while we were looking at redoing the playground was how do we maintain the shade trees and all of that um, so we're not losing that uh, piece of, of information in the good shade and, and our resources. So go ahead and go to the next slide, Michael. So this, I'm not going to read through all this. This was all in the presentation from October, but it just kind of goes over the, the process that we went through um, and kind of will lead in. And the two pictures of our, are of the current Dodge Field um, playground, uh, what is there now. And I'll get into what's going to happen with that equipment when I talk about next steps. Next slide. So what was our goal? Our goal was to have an accessible, or is to have an accessible playground with as much of the equipment available for everyone's use while maintaining the fun and challenges for all. Because obviously one of the things we like is when our kids have to uh, work as a mom of three. I can uh, remember those days where they were burning off energy. Of course there are constraints, the biggest one being budgetary. We did appropriate uh, money and we received some grant money. Um, we didn't we don't have any way to change the area of Dodge Field so we that was we had to stay within the boundaries of that current area um, the existing trees and tree root system and then points of access is to make sure that um, it was safe for the kids and how to how to keep everybody um, in so the next two slides are going to show you a little bit about the playground and Michael's going to help me out by pointing at things as I <laughs> as I mentioned them. This is an aerial view, and so this is just to kind of orient you um, to the space so you can see where the playground will be, same location that it is now by the, the field house. Um, all of the perimeter trees are staying. They're not being touched. We do have to get rid of a couple in the middle, but as we said in the October presentation, we will be um, planting more um, in other locations around Dodge Field and that sort of thing to ensure that we don't lose the trees permanently. Um, so, but, and it kind of just shows you, it butts up right up to the field house and then it maintains the um, area. And I'll explain what all the brown is around it as well. So if you can go to the next slide, Michael. So this is a close up or a closer up version, um, which is available outside um, if you really want to get a closer look so that you can see. So the key components are the on the what I'm going to call the top of oh, with <laughs> the top of the slide yep and that's what's highlighted in the in the zoomed in part that is an area for two to five year olds that's you know designated for them uh, again as a mom of three I also know that my twins would chase their older brother 
Um, so the other is safe, although there are things there for five to 12 year olds. Uh, there's also a little, you know, kind of crawl through playhouse um, in the middle as well. And then there are three benches that will be in the direct area in the playground with no back, so you can face either direction or both directions should you have children running all over the place. Um, the swings, um, we are adding some additional um, all access swings that will allow um, children with disabilities of various kinds to either be lifted into the swing um, and be able to use it themselves or have help. Um, and then of course baby swings and the typical um, swings that are on any playground. The green, um, yep, the green thing, for lack of a better word, is um, it is considered an all-accessible kind of merry-go-round. If For those of you, um, or most of you in the room, there's the, um, what we used to spin on where, you know, you could fly off and <laughs> it was who was going to get hurt and how fast could you spin. It's the updated version. Um, and it, you, it gives room to kind of sit. So again, you can put somebody that's in a wheelchair so that they can go around it with their friends. I can tell you they have one at the playground across the street from my high school. And whenever we go to take photographs, it is one of the favorites of the 15 to 18 year old crowd, which cracks me up. Um, but we're there when there are no kids there, obviously. But it's a, just a nice feature to have. Um, one of the things that I fought for <laughs> the most out of a lot of this is the next little section, which are musical instruments um, for kids that like the sensory and the noise and are not runners and not players, but they want to be outside. So it gives a space there. It is separated enough that um, it shouldn't impact kids who have the sensory issues at the other end and you know need quiet areas. So. Um, there's a xylophone, there's uh, bongos, um, and then within that, the um, piece that has the two arms with the brown arms and the white, you can see a, a child in a wheelchair sitting there. Um, it gives them another access um, for, uh, I don't remember what we're putting there, but it's some sort of interactive thing. Again, open to anybody. Anybody can use it, but it allows them to participate. The other thing that the committee talked about the most was for the older playground, older age playground, is it's no good if a kid can get up on a ramp, get up to a part of the, you know, and then their friends get to continue on and they have to turn around and go back the same way. So you can go from ramp all the way through to, and there's several exits where they can get off at any point. Um, obviously the slides are not you have to do go upstairs to get to the slide. So that is not an all access. But everything else, there's sensory things along the way, quiet sensory things, educational things, things that spin, things that go. Um, you know, we're still picking out exactly what we're going to put there, but there will be that throughout. Um, and there is turnarounds for kids in wheelchairs or kids with um, some sort of walking assistance. Uh, whether that's canes or a walker or whatever, they can do a full 360 in several places if they do desire to, to not continue um, through the mess of the, or the maze, I should say, not the mess. And then, Michael, where the, jet, the boy is in the green shirt and the jeans to the left. Yeah, that is a rocker. Um, it's got seats in it. So you've got, um, you can sit. Uh, I believe it's three on each side. You can put it there. A wheelchair can still fit with people on each side in the middle. And basically, one kid, even with a wheelchair, I have seen it done, can push on that and get it to move back and forth. Um, so that's a, nice, that's a nice feature there. And then all the way in the upper corner, um, there is kind of the newfangled seesaw. I'm sorry, Michael, I'm going behind the two to five-year-old. Um, area, but this is also this is this holds adults on it, but it allows kind of a little safer, you know, standing or sitting. For those of you that um, saw the presentation in October, one of our hopes was for a zip line um, because we know that's a favorite. However, to get that handicapped accessible, which does exist, they have one that's side by side that you can either zip line on one side or you can sit or stand on the other side. Um, besides cost being out of reach, they're much longer than the one that's there now, and we would have lost so much 
of the other equipment that we decided it was a better use of our money um, to do it this way. Um, the goals when we plan this is that rubberized surface, the blue is all rubberized surface, and you only want to do that once. You don't want to have to go back and put equipment into it because that's when you start to see the bending and the cracking and all of that stuff. So it's, a, it's an even pour substance, completely flat, completely ADA accessible, um, what you're seeing on most new playgrounds. Um, we did have to cut some equipment due to budget. Um, so if anybody's got a money tree or a will to donate, um, please reach out because before we start building, there would be other equipment um, that we'd love to see, um, but the money just ran out. There are shades over all of the playground structures. Um, the flagpole that is currently there will remain there. We have to figure out where we're going to put it, but it's not going anywhere. And the big rock um, that's at the front either will remain at the front or, again, will remain there because I know my kids would have killed me if I got rid of it. They jumped off it for years. Um, so that's kind of the area. The brown around the area is going to be all mulch, and we've been in talks with um, Tom Salaki and David Mann from Parks um, about planting beds there, flowers, and that sort of stuff. The one area... Um, closest to that green, which represents the, the shed, that's actually going to have tables and benches. Zach Ellis, who is um, in charge of all the rec um, sports in town, among lots of other things, his budget is going to maintain, be able to help us pay for the benches, which is why you don't see any on this design. There will be benches. Um, and some tables so that there's a little picnic area um, and that sort of thing as well. But we're going to try and get some flowers in there and work with parks and shade tree and everybody else. Um, to make sure that that happens. Um, there will be a bike rack um, on the, but basically between Dodge Field and the playground um, rather than, and I think we decided only on one rather than two, even though this is showing two. I'll have to go back and check. We had one at the front and one at the back and then decided that was like 30 bikes worth of, um, so to, to get rid of one of those. But there will be benches all the way around. Um, there will be one or two benches that are kind of offset for those kids that need a break for whatever reason, um, which will be nice. And then uh, it will go there. It will be completely fenced in. Um, there was a long debate about do we close it in the back, um, but it looks like we are headed that way. We just have to figure out the best fencing, and it looks like we're going to continue the um, fencing that went in couple years ago around the basketball court so it all matches um, and also it's cheaper um, so um, what that'll be the the big missing question um, and then funding if you'll go to the next slide Michael like I said we received one hundred and twenty five thousand dollars from the Morris County Community Development Block Grant five hundred fifty thousand five hundred and fifty five thousand dollars was appropriated from open space recreation and historic preservation Zach is generously using funds from his annual budget for new benches and tables for the playground to help save some costs DPW and thanks to Ken O'Brien for saying that he was willing to help us um, is going to assist with some of the site the pre-site work um, the demolition of what's currently there um, which leads me into the next steps and will also answer the question about Del Barton um, so council approval to proceed obviously is one of our next steps because then we can go through the Educational Services Commission um, co-op we don't have to go out to bid this is all co-op priced the goal we had hoped to do this early spring or I'm sorry late spring early summer um, it took us long enough to come up with the exact design that we wanted that we are looking at a late summer, end of August, early fall project start date and they are telling us 45 days start to finish from site demo to when the playground's open. So we're trying to minimize that time as much as humanly possible, um, but we can't do it in the winter either. So we had to take some playground time away. Um, we have playgrounds at Del Barton and Lucy D. Uh, that both need updating. There's been requests for MRC. There's been requests um, for Niles Park to be evaluated. Um, that one I personally think is probably the most least likely because there's no parking in that triangle shape, but maybe somebody can come up with something creative. They will be much cheaper than this because they will just be um, new equipment. The original plan was, and we had said this, we were going to relocate the Dodge Field equipment um, as a, a reusable to another. Uh, when we talked to the company about it, the, 
playground equipment that's there is, and what it will be there is anchored in concrete. So there's no way to get it out without damaging it. Um, evidently they've tried it before and it ends up not happening and then it's not guaranteed to be safe, which is what we want first for our children. Um, but the park's master plan, including new equipment for Del Barton, is on the drawing board, including a design process to improve the play experience and address those wet conditions that were mentioned um, on the site. So it, we, they haven't been forgotten. We, we will be doing them um, 2024, 2025 is the hope. Um, again, just with some uh, updated equipment, but it won't be the fully all access. We say we're just doing that at the main um, Dodge Field playground. And then I think the next slide is questions. Questions or comments from the council? Uh, Bob? Yeah, I just have a comment. Uh, first step, thank you for this. Uh, Madison is a family town, lots of children, and this is sorely needed. So thank you for spearheading this. The one thing I would want to do mention is how detailed and how well thought out this playground is, even to the extent that you have those benches without backs so people could sit there and look either way. That just shows not only like a design thought, but a, a parent thought. So no, it was very well done and I'm Thank looking you. forward to this. Thank you. Other uh, comments or questions? Nope. Yep. Uh, Rachel. I'll, I'll add, thank you, Deb, for addressing the, um, the need to bring our other parks up to a level of, of good repair. I worked with the residents in the uh, Del Barton Niles neighborhood last fall to help bring some basic uh, maintenance and upkeep to Del Barton Park with the understanding that it was uh, you know, something we would do to, to keep it functional and uh, slightly more appealing in the short term. Uh, with the hope that we could uh, improve the equipment there. And so it's uh, disappointing to hear that we can't reuse the Dodge Field equipment. Um, obviously, we need the equipment to be reinstalled in a warrantable state. And so if that's not possible, then, you know, as you say, safety concerns prevail here. But um, I think it's important that uh, we keep Del Barton especially on the top of the list. I know it was included as the, one of the top three priorities in the recent um, parks plan that was um, prepared by the Parks Advisory Committee. And so I know it will continue to be at the top of the list um, for future improvements in the short term. Yeah, it definitely, it definitely is, with one of the biggest challenges being the wetlands in that area. So trying to figure out how to balance it definitely needs an update to the playground area it's the same playground from when my kids played t-ball and <laughs> whatever and my twins are 18 and my oldest one is about to turn 21 um, so it's been a while um, you know but it's I it's a process because we looked at that as well when we were talking about moving it would it even fit within the because we can't really expand the footprint of that playground but thank you Looks great, and it's uh, come a long way from the Dodge Field of my childhood. Not to make it sound old, but <laughs> the waiting pool and um, the ten-foot metal slide that uh, you would you would convince your um, newcomer friends that were there to go slide down on a hot summer day and watch them scream. Yep. So <laughs> safety is key. So we've come a long ways. All right. We will now move on to the budget hearing. This is uh, we have electric utility, water utility, and public works. And uh, they will be covering some of the accomplishments of past year, their goals for the coming year, and their major budget requests. And uh, they're going to try to be as concise as possible with the understanding if they go way too long, we will figure out how to cut their budget. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. Just real briefly, uh, just to kick things off, there's a significant presentation that council's been given that will be on RoseNet. We're not going to talk to all the slides. Uh, the agenda this evening you discussed is the next slide, Michael. The next slide after that talks about transparency. You can find everything on Rosner, as Councilwoman Cohen said. The next slide talks about the hearing schedule, which uh, Councilwoman uh, Cohen had mentioned in her liaison report. The next slide shows the breakdown of the tax bill, which we show all the time. We send out the tax bill, and it feels like we get 100% of the brunt because people are upset that we mail it out, but we're only 22 0.1% uh, of the bill, the rest goes to the school board and to the um, 
County. So uh, with that, I'm going to have Ken come up here and talk about water utility and public works, then Jim Matina, and then I'll come back and talk about the utility's uh, financial performance. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, thank you for having me. Deb, I'd just like to um, add one thing to the playground at Dodge to be considered by the playground committee. If you were to think about adding a solar-powered wireless phone charging uh, to the bench area where the parents spend some time, it's possible that someone from working from home I like might that. be able to charge their uh, laptop and also uh, be able to work in a park a little bit. <clears throat> thank you. Um, so we're going to get started uh, on our accomplishments. <clears throat> Pretty much summed up what we do. Jim Burnett, thank you very much for taking that picture. It's a nice fall picture of one of our parks. Um, the styrofoam recycling moved along this year. This was our first full year in doing it. We've now uh, worked with Long Hill Township so that we have a dual uh, stream place to take it to. So we're not just locked into one vendor. We can take it to uh, Long Hill Township, which actually um, compacts it and uses it and takes it to a different vendor. So um, I never like being locked into one vendor. And so this is a, another avenue for us to work on that. And that um, is a joint venture we do with Chatham Bar and Chatham Township. <clears throat> Uh, we work with the police and electric department to install new pedestrian signs around town. I know you guys are involved in that. You see it. Um, we took a bunch of the plants from the Civic Center and we relocated them. And then we just do our day-to-day -day operations. And I just want to let you know that sometimes our day-to-day -day operations, you know, every day when I come in or when I, I watch the weather, I'm always looking five to ten days out. Are we going to be having to do some stuff outside? Is there a storm coming? Is there a hurricane coming? Is there a tornado coming? Is there a six-inch snowstorm coming? Is there talking about an eight-inch snowstorm or a mega storm? You know, coming. Uh, and so there's a lot of preparation that goes in to that. It's not just um, oh, it's going to snow tomorrow, so we're going to throw some snow plows on or something like that. It's an involved maintenance thing that we do so that we're ready to serve the citizens of the municipality. And at any given time, you know, I always say that we don't always get paid for what we do. It's for what we might have to do. Because at any given time, that phone rings and there's a major tree that came down or it took down uh, power lines and a pole and it's got some roads closed or there's a blockage in the sewer department. And, you know, we've had that a few times this summer. That's why we talked about people uh, putting grease down the drains. You know, I think we're seeing that uh, soon after the Thanksgiving weekend. So we don't know if there's something along those lines that's uh, but that but so it's it's a concern at any time we're called out you know to treat an emergency so um, there's a lot of prep work goes in that that goes into our job that you guys may not always see but I just want you to know that my job is to best prepare the Department of Public Works for any type of emergency like I said that phone can ring or that weather report can come in and can change our whole day and what we do uh, <clears throat> we are very low on injuries in the workplace, which is something we strive to work on quite a bit. It does happen. We have a physical job. We have a labor job. So on occasion, we get a back injury, a leg injury, or shoulder, or something like that, or a cut. Um, we're going to work with the police department on upgrading the police firing range during hurricane, um, during one of the last few hurricanes, uh, heavy weather. They have some storage containers down there where they keep some stuff in there. Uh, and some of the targets and stuff got wet and used, so we're just going to elevate them up uh, about 24 inches of stone, put some clean stone down so that it can uh, not happen again because it's in a lower-lying area. That area we talk about in Del Barton with the Del Barton Park, uh, one of the er things we struggle with is that if you look at the topography of the municipality, that is a water area. That's one of the lowest areas in the municipality, and that's where a lot of the rainwater dra drains to. So when you hear that there's some puddles and water down there, I went down in that area the last couple of times it was raining, and a lot of the yards all adjoining that area all had puddles in, in, in the backyards and in the front yards, because that's where, if you look at some of the wells are in the municipality in that area, the water drains to that low area. That's why it's uh, in that wetlands area, so we are going to have some restrictions when we go to uh, put some park stuff in there. Uh, the public works facility, we're upgrading the window project, and we're looking at the heating system. So we're going to kind of take a couple steps. I think we can have a good facility for solar at some point, but we need to take some steps to get there. And one is to upgrade the building, like the, the windows, and um, then the next thing would obviously be the heating system. Uh, and then we'll look at the solar and stuff like that. But we may have to work on the roof. Bob Vogel is working on that with us, but it's going to be a process. And, 
you know, luckily we put a little planning into it. Rachel helps us with that. That you know, we didn't run out and get a contractor to put, you know, um, solar panels on the roof, and it really wasn't ready or something like that. So, you know, we, we were thinking along those lines. So we've backed it down. And like it, it's a process to do it, and, and we'll get there through it. Uh, we do capital projects meetings. I'm involved in that myself. And Mr. Duffy, the executive assistant, we go and we talk with the engineering department and the zoning officer. Uh, Mr. Burnett and Mr. Cody and sometimes one or two other people that are involved in some projects and we just try to keep tabs on the contractors that are working in town and what are going uh, coming and goings and I think that um, that's been proved very helpful to the municipality because sometimes you know um, different set of eyes on different jobs we see things Bob sees something I see something we can talk about it and try to smooth it over we can you know meet with a contractor real quick on a Friday morning or something like that to try to get a job either moving along or slow down or something happens so that's been proved kind of helpful about that um, A subtle hint. Yeah, subtle hint. <laughs> okay. Uh, the Department of Public Works, I said, is our budget. Uh, we have a building in the back that we use for indoor storage. We call it the paint shed. We're talking about replacing that dome storage access paving in and around them. Um, we want to put eventually a conveyor system in. We are somewhat limited to the amount of salt we can haul, hold. And so in the wintertime, you know, not this winter in so to speak, but in the winter time, when you see and hear about um, salt storage, you know, being low and salt supplies getting low, he who has salt wins the Black Road uh, thing. So we have an idea that we are going to put a conveyor system in our um, uh, salt dome so that we'll be able to get better use out of the top of them. So right now, our heavy bucket loaders can only push the salt up so high. So the idea is that we'll have a conveyor system and we'll kind of put like a little bit of a snow cone inside the conveyor, which will probably give us another four or five hundred tons per thing. So, like I said, he who has the salt in the wintertime wins the race. Uh, we're talking about replacing a 20-ton dump truck um, next year. The uh, mower, which is on the uh, capital budget, electric mower, zero turn, and a two-ton uh, mason dump truck for plowing it and has a dump truck. And then we're going to have a little conversation again about uh, purchasing a Jeep with a plow on it. And if you want to talk about that now, or if you want to wait on that, that's fine. I know that might come up in conversation. So, um, you know, I talked to a couple of council members about it on Friday, and everyone knows where I stand with that. So, um, that's just, you know, the pump stations, we do a lot of stuff. It says treatment of the pumps, there's, there's always stuff to do. Redevelopment casings, the casings are very deep. Sometimes they wear out, sometimes they get rusted. There's just things that have to happen to them. It's all type, it's, maintenance stuff. Um, the SCADA system is a reading system for the wells and the pumps and what we have and that's just a, like a maintenance upgrade that we kind of do throughout the course of the year. The Midwood uh, tank needs to be repainted. That's kind of getting it ready prepped up because it'll be a much bigger expense when we go to do it. Um, they do five-year inspections of them. The mains, the valves and replacements, we have a company coming in to uh, assist us with turning valves and there's a new state regulation that you have to turn them I think it's like 20% or 25% and so we're going to do that and then we're going to GPS them so our valves will be GPS that's required by the state and that there'll be a GPS and we'll be eventually able to you know have on your phone access to exactly where the valves are because on occasion we do lose valves how do we lose valves every now and then a paving company paves over it and we're not aware of it or something happens and um, the county comes by and does a job or the state does a job and we're not aware of it and the valve gets paved over and on occasion we lose valves so um, that'll help in doing that it doesn't happen that often but it does um, the operations of the garage the um, GIS Jim Burnett can talk to you a little bit about that and then the meters which I think you all know about is I'm not sure where we are with that but there was meter, meters that will be installed the uh, efficiency meters and we'll be able to read those automatically and that will save both time and we'll get a um, breakdown of the water usage for uh, commercial and residential use and that, that'll be actually I think that'll be very helpful to the people too because uh, there's probably some people that are paying more for water because their toilets are running or sinks are dripping they may not realize it exactly but we'll be able to give you some information on that and I think that that'll be uh, helpful for some people and just to point out the previous slide was um, general capital and then the slide you just went over is water capital okay yep just to so, uh, any questions for uh, Ken or comments? Tom? Tom? Mr. 
provide good presentation, good planning doesn't seem like any huge expenses coming up for the uh, for the uh, you know, control technology in the case. And I want to thank you and your crew for participating. Oh, my microphone. I have to say it all over again? Gosh, I, I don't remember what I said. You got me? Anyway, you're, you and your crew are always very willing to help participating when there's something that you guys can help the town with. Demoing the playgrounds, helping around the parks where we're doing bridges, and you guys step it up all the time, which is great. And you're, you're a good leader from that respect. Uh, I am anxious to hear what you plan to do when you do uh, modify the heating system over at the garage it's going to be a big difference and probably a big expense but long term hopefully we make it as efficient as possible there's a lot of options now it is we're going to look at it. it's a very inefficient system right now but we're going to look at a um and i'm assuming the climate action ad hoc committee will be involved in but we'll be looking at heat pump system yeah there's a lot of, that's a great option too or geothermal too i'm a fan of that um and then also as you you know as long as you can maintain the vehicles you have this is one thing we talked about and wait to see if the options change in the near future for some kind of partial electric vehicles. Uh, you'll also see a big savings there too if you can get a uh, 50 or a 75 mile a day car or Jeep or pickup truck that somehow helps your department where it's feasible. That, that's gonna save us climate wise, probably save us money also using our own electricity at five or six cents a kilowatt instead of buying gasoline, 350 a gallon. So I know you're, I know you're working on that, and I appreciate your efforts there. Rachel? Yeah, just to pick up on Tom's point, I was speaking with Ken and Tom on Friday and highlighted how in this capital budget, there's an item in 2023 for $55,000 and a second one in 2024 for $55,000, and that's for a Jeep. And, you know, the coincidence of uh, tonight introducing a goal that we replace our gas-powered fleet with plug-in electric vehicles as they become available, and then in the next presentation, you know, setting aside over $100,000 to buy new gas-powered vehicles, the irony is not lost on me. It's a great example of how we need to address these items on a case-by-case -case basis right now. I understand, based on research that the Climate Action Committee provided to TPW and you know Ken's review of that, that the current uh, generation of plug-in electric hybrid Jeeps does not have the battery capacity and the power to do plowing. And we use those Jeeps to plow our commuter lots because they're you know agile, they can get around parked cars, and that's the vehicle of choice for providing a high level of service for plowing as opposed to, uh, you know, a bigger truck in, in those lots. And so um, here's a perfect example on the first night that we talk about this where we would love to buy the electric version of that Jeep. But if the electric version can't perform to the spec that we need, uh, perhaps it's not the right replacement candidate at this time. That does underscore, though, the utility of this um, mileage goal, which is the, the point is that 25% of our municipal fleet mileage be from plug-in electric vehicles. And uh, to the extent that we can lean on those plug-in electrics to generate you know, more of our mileage in the coming years and um, start to retire the gas-powered ones, it, there's there's going to be uh, you know a discussion every time this comes up that we want to buy a new truck or a new Jeep to see is, is the electric version available. So um, I'm looking forward to reviewing you know these options as they come up. And thanks for taking the time to talk us through you know what you can and can't use right now. And we'll keep the conversation going. Thank you. And I think with the you know five-year budget, you know we're going to find that. Uh, Years four and five are shifting gears into more electric. And uh, while it's frustrating, we're buying a gas Jeep. On the flip side, we're buying a all electric uh, lawnmower, which is uh, going to be a, a great, great step in the right direction. Right. So <clears throat> one of the things we talked about on Friday is that our vehicles and the type of work we do, it's called severe duty. Um, at any given time when there's a storm or something like that, our vehicles are somewhat labeled as a severe duty <laughs> vehicle long hours, plowing, hauling brush, trees coming down, tornadoes, fixing roads. Um, the technology is just not there yet in an electric vehicle. Now, I was at a League of Municipalities conference and I saw more electric 
EV um, small pieces of equipment than I'd seen in any previous year. It's coming, right? The, the, the technology is coming. It's not there now. I don't think it'll be for that kind of work, especially plowing um, in the next three to five years. But there's technology coming out there, and there's other ways to do things. I, I'm not saying I'm not a believer in it. I'm not against it. I just don't think that right now um, that, like we talked about, is going to fit our needs. We do have other vehicles in our fleet. We have a building department. We have a um, meter readers, parking authority, you know, we, we are upgrading the, the vehicles to electric vehicles, right, where we can. But when you talk about public works, police, fire, it's always labeled in state contracts and will be a severe duty. And that is because we operate under the worst conditions possible. Yep. The absolute worst conditions. When everyone is shut down, the governor is telling you to stay off the roads, that's because we have to go out on the roads. And that's what we call a severe duty. Yeah. When everyone's told to stay home because you're getting a tornado or a hurricane, that's us you see driving down the road, going down the road, working. Okay, yeah, I, so. I think we, you know, <clears throat> Rachel mentioned, recognize that yep. technology is shifting and, and so we will shift off. And I just want to emphasize the other that just hit me with the lawnmower is probably the greatest personal exposure to exhaust is not when a uh, DPW uh, person's driving a Jeep, but when he's sitting on top of a lawnmower and is right there on top of it. So this yeah, is and the commercial mowers have come a long way and you've seen them all over now. This can make a big difference. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Thanks, Ken. No. Any other questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> Jimmy Jet Matina. How are you? Jim Matina. Hello everyone. Welcome to the council, Tom. All right. Let's start it off. Michael. Here's our complete projects. We place the mold poles and transformers as needed. We install one riser at 14 Lincoln Place. Everyone knows what that is, the old movie theater. We're just waiting on them to run their primary and get their transformer. We install five poles down on Community Place. That's all energized. We had the interns this year paint all the Victorian lampposts at the railroad station, Wavy Plate parking lot. We did order a 750 kV transformer for the project at Cook Avenue parking lot. Next. And here's our goals and objectives. We're trying to order some transformers for backup on the municipal building, the fire building, the library, but it's going to take a while to get them. Oh, sorry. We continue to upgrade our tie points and make new tie points. James Park. We're upgrading our relays. Kings Road, we're upgrading relays. And Well B uh, Station, we have the transformer, we have the poles, we have the underground wire. We're just waiting for uh, Bob Vogel to give us the okay to do that. We still got to run a new fiber line between the two substations. So we could splice that into our relays and do much more with it and replace an open wire secondary. That's our wire out in the street. You see that cloth wire that's hanging? That's all old wire. We're replacing that right now. We don't want to use all our material because it's so hard to get materials. And, and bucket truck training, pole top training, substation training. We train every day. Every day, whatever we do. We got three new guys. It's setting up trucks we're training, learning, showing them how to use tools. Everything's training. Next, Michael. All right, this is ongoing activity. Everyone has uh, one of these. I'm not going to go through it all. That's what we do all the time. Next. And here's our special projects. We got to get these relays done. James Park, we have relays in one side, and now we got to put the relays on the other side. Kings Road substation, that's in progress right now. The Sampson Prospect tie point, Ridgedale Avenue and Greenwood tie point is a big tie point. We're probably going to get that done this year and get back to this upcoming project. Everybody knows all these projects. 16 Waverly Place, upgrade electric service into transformer vault. That's not done yet. 297 Main Street, replace pole and transformer. 14 Lincoln Place, like I said before. We're waiting on the contractor to run the primary lights and their transformer. We're already done with our poll. We're ready for them. 
and making new tie points from Ridgedale Circuit to Greenwood. It's a big tie point. That's going to probably get done this year, unless we have any storms and other stuff that happens. 18 Madison Avenue, there's a demo, followed by a new building, new pole and transfer for that. 120 Madison Avenue is a demo, followed by a new building, new pole and transformer. Cook Avenue parking lot, reconstruction. 5 Central Avenue, electric upgrade and transformer. And 286 and 294 Main Street, Madison Mall Apartments, it's electrical upgrade for 40 additional units. And 28 Walnut Street, community place, electrical upgrade for the new moderate housing complex. And last is 1315, go back, 1315 Prospect Street. It's an electrical upgrade for the new building. That's the old Wiker building. So that's going to be a big building. That's a big upgrade. So there's a lot going on with the town. So these new relays we're putting into the town helps out to read demand and everything else. We, we don't have that with the old relays. So new re relays mean a lot. All right. So I'm pretty good. I'm not like Ken O'Brien. We're just looking for a, a <laughs> single bucket truck. That's it. <laughs> Sorry, Ken. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> no competition. But it already went up a little bit. Uh, yeah, the single bucket we have right now is 13 years old. We try to get rid of the trucks around 12. So 13, it's going to take two and a half years. You're up to 15. Jimmy, if you can get back closer to the microphone again. Us. All right. The single bucket that we have now is 12 years old, almost 13 years old. The time we order this truck and get it in, it's probably going to be two to three years. So we're looking at 15 years on a, on a single bucket truck that's been beat up pretty good. And uh, down here is that 10,000. That's all Bob Vogel's stuff. Uh, the skater system, that's us, the 50,000. And the 250 is for our roof at the water and light plant. And once we get that roof on, then we could just try to put solar on our roof and do everything what Ken said. That's it. All right, thank you. So um, I know we have some visitors from other towns, so just to uh, alert you to how things are different in Madison, you would not hear this presentation in most towns because most towns in New Jersey do not own their electric utilities. So by the fact we're able to own our electric utility, we can make major initiatives and deliver reliable power. Deb? Just a quick question. Um, I know there have been supply chain issues on the transformers. I think the last one took 11 months or some ridiculous amount of time. Is that still an issue? Yes. Because I saw there were a whole bunch of transformers you're hoping to order, but we don't expect them for six, eight. It could even be longer than that. Yeah. And then the other question, 120 Madison Avenue, hasn't that, that's been demoed? Yes, so we're just waiting for the new building? Yeah. Okay, I just wanted to make sure I had the right building in my head. Right. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Tom? Thanks, Mr. Martina. That's a great presentation. A lot of things going on with your, your department. So are we going to be making plans the next five years, ten years, if we do get the borough to electrify more in the way that we live? Or do you think our infrastructure now, with all the upgrades you're making, will be ready? I don't know how, how hard we're going. I mean, after Rachel's presentation, you see we have... Uh, if we keep doing these upgrades and, and maintain our substations and our circuits, we'll be all right. That's awesome. So then we'll be ready for that. Another question I had, and maybe Jim Burnett can answer this. It says here you have 95 anticipated new service installations. So is that homes? That's house services. Excuse me? That's house services. House service. So, so new means that the homeowner is going to pay some fees and they're going to pay the borough to do these installations. New and upgrade on their house is a new service. Right. Uh, people knocking the house down, putting two houses up, their new services. So that's a little bit of a revenue stream for the borough sure. too? Sure. Okay. That's awesome. And then w there's something else here that you said. We're going to prepare for a 1,600 line clearance. Somewhere is that over here? Line clearance for the town. So what is that? That's, we hire a contractor to come in. There's only uh, a crew of two in their truck. They give us a price for 13 weeks, and they trim all our lines out. Oh, okay. So tree, 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 tree trim. Trees. Oh, tree, tree trim. trim. 
Got it. We Perfect. tried to do it on our own, and we just couldn't do it. You know, no. work eight hours a day, and then go after work for a couple hours in the 90 degree weather. The guys tried it; they just can't make. It. And it has to be a certified company, so you won't see an honored tree doing it. It would be, it would be yeah. another uh, state certified or county certified. It's, again, it's a great coordination we have uh, for the ability of owning mm -hmm. owner electric utility. You you hear about the horror stories in JCP and L towns and. PSCNG, where they come in and do the line clearance without any coordination with Shade Tree yeah. and so on, where we've got sure. that coordination. Sure. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Rachel. Thank you, Jim. Uh, I see that one thing that is not in our 2023 projection is a set aside to our reserve funding for a substation. And I know that we uh, are typically very diligent about putting money into that fund so that we can do things like replace the relays and keep our system in a good state of repair. But we have a couple of big ticket items this year between the bucket truck and the, um, the roof replacement. So um, I'm glad to see that we're getting, you know, we're staying on track with the reserve funding in subsequent years. But I take it this was a calculated decision to fund some of these uh, one-time items. I see Jim's taking this one. It actually shows up in the operating budget, which is uh, a few pages later in, in my part of the presentation. We are going to continue to fund that substation reserve. We need to. Jim's got some major projects like these relays that he has. As a matter of fact, we wrote some ordinances out recently for that. So we are funding that. It doesn't show up in capital. It actually shows up as an operating line and gets reserved. Okay. Thanks for addressing that. Right, any other questions or comments for Jim? Thank you very much, and uh, not that we're competitive, but your presentation was shorter than. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> Does that mean he gets more capital, Mayor? Oh, Ken, Ken, Ken did have two departments. Okay, okay, that's fair. That's fair. So we're going to go through a lot of these slides quickly and only focus on a couple. Uh, Michael, next slide just talks about transparency and the fact that we've been transferring utility fund balance since at least 1944 into the municipal budget. It's, it's fantastic and it's why the borough has so many services that other towns don't have included um, in the municipal budget. Next rate shows um, residential rates for all the electric utilities in the state of New Jersey. Only two, us and Butler, have actually reduced um, electric rates from when you compare 2016 to 2022. We're in the middle of the pack in terms of our rates. Um, all this information is available online if anybody wants to look at it. Next slide is something we are going to talk about a little bit. Um, I've talked to a few of you individually about it. This is our portfolio of contracts where we've purchased electric. And we have not made a purchase since 2020. The market's been a little volatile, obviously, uh, during COVID and then with the natural gas shortages and everything else. But we only have 50% of our uh, need purchased starting in 2025. So we're 100% covered in this year and in next year um, with excellent contracts. But if we were to go and buy contracts now, you're seeing prices of 25, 29, 30. The prices would be north of $50, $55 or more. So we need to start looking at that. We don't have to do it right away. We've got at least 18 months, but I may be coming back to council in two or three months saying, let's go out and buy just 10% of 2025. Let's see what happens. Let's see what comes in. PSENG is the least preferred provider because of their energy mix is um, the most carbon producing. So uh, it will be interesting to see if we go out and even get indicative pricing or just by that one, that 10%, it, who, who's, who's competitive, who wants to bid out there. The closer we get to 2025, the less um, volatility there is in the market, the more certainty there is. And, Theoretically, we should be getting better pricing. Um, natural gas reserves, warm winter, all those things can, can help. But this is just something we need to be focused on and thinking about um, in the, uh, it, absolutely in the next year. So um, next slide just shows our AMI portal, um, how many electric and water meters we have installed. Next slide talks about some of our uh, concerns. Um, sales and collections were off a little bit due to office parks um, not being really energized as much over the last year. Um, we do have some concerns with our electric, electric costs in 2025. We just talked about contracts being much more expensive. Um, we will have an excellent year with our contracts this year and next year because of the um, smart purchases that we made thanks to 
uh, council's past um, for their help and support in doing that. Fund balance generation in the electric utility was excellent in 2022. Um, and this uh, fund balance, um, increasing fund balance over the next two years will allow us to manage any potential increase in uh, electric costs in 2025 and 2026. Um, we'll go to the next slide. Uh, this is um, basically the uh, revenues, expenses, and then the bottom section is what's generation of, generation of fund balance. And you want to see a solid generation of fund balance. So if you look at E15, line E15, you're seeing that it was pretty, it was not great in the last few years. But we're projecting some good years uh, in 2020, 2022 had a good year, and we're projecting a good year in 2023. So uh, that is uh, almost entirely due to uh, the cost of electricity going down. Weirdly, uh, capacity costs went down. We anticipate those going up. Um, there's certainly some exposure to transmission costs going up in the future. We've talked about that. JCPNL and, P and um, FERC and the BPU are coming out with who's going to pay for the transmission of all the off offshore wind. And we're going to have to pay our fair share of that, and that's going to cost. Um, the goal with the financial performance of the electric utility is that it's sustainable and predictable fund balance generation and operations that helps us maintain our AAA bond rating and, and the like. So um, we'll go to the next slide, which talks about the MRC carport. Um, uh, this has a snapshot of pretty much everything that we need to do. I'm not going to read through all of it, but uh, it's a $2 million cost. We're going to receive $600,000 from the federal government. We'll get $100,000 a year in SREX for 15 years. So as I talked about at the last meeting, add those two numbers up, the carport's paid for, right? 15, 15 years times $100,000 is $1.5 million. $800,000 from the federal government, we have more than $2 million in hand. That doesn't even take into account the electricity that it generates. We're anticipating um, being able to reduce um, municipal, what, what the municipality pays the electric utility. Believe it or not, we pay a bill for this building to the electric utility, just like everybody else. And um, this bill will go down to zero. And the bill at the MRC will go down to zero. It'll be a savings of $90,000 a year to the municipality for as long as this solar carport is going. But there are a lot of steps we need to take. The biggest one right now is we're trying to find out the rules for that federal dollars. We've reached out to Mikey Sherrill's office. We've been um, reaching out to anyone we can at the Treasury, at the IRS. We're not, I don't want to move forward and bid this project out until we know how that we're guaranteed to get $800,000 out of the $2 million project. We will have to change the borough code to waive the solar cap. There's a solar cap of 100 kV. We want to waive that for all government entities. That would be the borough, the Board of Education, and the Madison Housing Authority. So that would be a significant benefit to the Board of Education to be able to install solar on their roofs. We'd want to create what's called net metering rate for government entities. Um, that's basically a solar rate for government entities and for larger. We only have a net metering rate for residential. We have to change the borough code to permit remote net metering, where you have solar in one location, but the credits from that generation can be applied to this building here or to public safety. So we need to pass that. And then we need to appropriate funds, issue the bid, and hopefully, if we hear about the ITC tomorrow, we could be building this later on in the summer. So uh, Peter pretty much bugs me every day. So don't worry, we're working hard on that. So uh, it's really important for you to read this, send any questions to me that you have on it. I don't want to dwell on it any more than that. Uh, interesting slides are included. Michael, go to the next slide on uh, EV charging. Here's a home, an, here's a home with an EV charger. In a, an incredible amount of consumption during um, typically off-peak times, much higher than when they're consuming uh, electricity for air conditioning. Uh, next slide shows uh, a residential unit where the blue is uh, it's solar. They're generating electricity. The spikes are when they're charging their vehicle. So um, it's, some, it's causing some intricacies 
um, to have solar, to have EVs in our distribution system. And we're working with a uh, contractor, and uh, Rachel alluded to this, about hardening our infrastructure and making sure our distribution system can handle all this. So that's it for the electric utility. I can keep going quickly because the water utility will be about two minutes, and then I can uh, have you ask any questions. Next is uh, the water utility, and this is basically the uh, performance similar to the electric utility, showing revenues, expenses, or appropriations, and then the fund balance. We have put a lot of money away over the last few years in the water capital, um, anticipating that the replacement of the water meters was going to cost this much. It's only going to cost us this much. So we actually are in really good shape in water capital, and it would help us financially for various reasons I don't want to get into um, in detail to not appropriate as much in capital improvement this year. So if you look at line W6, you'll see capital improvement in 2022. We appropriated 900,000. I'm asking that we only appropriate 200,000 in 2023. Doing that, along with everything else we've done, will really put the water utility on, um, on firm footing. And uh, other than that, uh, let's go to the next slide, Michael. Um, administration's goals in general are hardening the system, figuring out the situation with our electric contracts, getting the MRC carport going, um, uh, residential electric rates make code change to understand. Uh, oh, so I, I would like to consider passing an ordinance where residences are required to just register that they have an electric vehicle. Um, you can have a 220 plug, which is what a, your dryer is, in your garage, buy a Tesla, give you a portable charger, plug into your 220 charger overnight. We would never know unless we start looking at everyone's consumption. And it's important to know if three homes that are all served by the same transformer, if they all have an electric vehicle, that could cause havoc to Jim's transformers and could actually cause equipment failure. So just having them registered would help us. Nothing, no cost, nothing. Just please let us know so we can kind of monitor the distribution and um, uh, 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 the electricity in that area. It will also help us to understand if we're coming close to our goals of how many EVs we have. Uh, install the automated water meters. We hope to do that um, later on in the year. Go out to bid on that. And then um, automate the solar application, model the rest of the grid, um, update the bill form, and research time use rates. Those are all things we're working on. Uh, one other thing, just to put the bee in the bonnet, is do we consider any sort of rate action for residential water users? We have 50 or so residential water users that are using 1,000 to 2,000 gallons of water a day during the summer. It's just something to think about. I presented about that last, last year, um, but no, nothing about that except for to put that bee in your bonnet. That's it. I'm here to answer any questions. Questions are Deb? Um, starting with electric, uh, you talk about in the portfolio of block contracts that within the next year we have to consider purchasing the remaining 50%, and if prices remain at the $50, then we have to reduce the dividend to zero. How low would that have to come down to, in 2025, sorry, how low would that have to come down so we don't have to necessarily reduce it to zero, even if we have to reduce it a little? I should probably change that. I don't think we need to reduce it to zero. Um, I'm going to look at those numbers again, but we may have to reduce the dividend. Probably not in 2025, because the fund balance will be so good in 2024 that we'll be able to kind of have a glide path. Maybe only have a million dollar dividend in 2025, a $250,000 dividend. But if we're doing more solar and we're earning $200,000 a year for that and everything else, we may be able to change the metric of the utility and uh, to our benefit to not to be able to maintain some of that dividend. Well, and thank you for leading into my next question so nicely. With the solar carport and generating of solar, how is that going to affect how much electricity we have to purchase if we're producing some amount? You may not even know the answer to that. That's obviously... Half a percent? <laughs> probably about half a percent of our electric <laughs> that we consume could be generated. It's 85 homes from that solar carport, but if we can get on to Ken and Jimmy's roofs, if we can get a solar carport over at the pool, we're just making things better. We're not only reducing our cost of electricity, we're reducing our capacity and transmission costs because we're reducing our overall load during the high um, peak summer times when those, when those get priced. 
So um, uh, that's it. <laughs> and then just the last thing, um, you mentioned towards the end on the water about the, the rates, and I definitely think that's worth re-looking at. Just, again, not even necessarily from the, the cost. I know we talked about with the amount, you showed the big graph with the top 30. I still can't figure out how they're using that much water. Um, as an incentive to, for them to figure out how to maybe use a little less um, because it would save them money on top of it. I, That's all. Yeah, I think we had consensus on moving forward, so we should should be drafting a record. Okay. Yeah. You got it. We'll do that, Mayor. And, and for everyone in the public, a five-gallon jug of water that you see at a water cooler costs two cents at the borough of Madison. So uh, water is a value, but use it sparingly. Other questions or comments? Rachel? Just wanted to add a little color here. We've seen in Jim's presentation that the utility is valuable to Madison for many reasons, including the fact that it's a source of revenue that we transfer to other funds. Um, and there's a question that some people have that if we are uh, encouraging and incentivizing solar, then how can Madison continue to have a profitable electric utility as more and more people adopt solar? And to give some context, it's projected that our electric demand will double by 2050 because we will move towards electrification of building systems and vehicles. And so we need to uh, continue to add generation here in town, uh, and we will still be resell reselling a huge amount of electricity because the demand will double. And so the the balance will work out assuming that we can do some of the complex work that you've described here to make sure that um, we are prepared for this mix of uh, generation and bi-directional flow on our grid C correct yes I, I don't see us having any change to our um, net metering policy anytime soon but we need to be looking at it and considering it residences can put solar on their house and not pay a penny and that's a great deal, and we want to encourage it. Um, at some point, we'll reach an inflection point. California has reached that already, and they're changing their net metering policies. But we're, way, we're years and years and years and years away from that, so I don't anticipate any changes there. It's good for us to look at and think about, but nothing will happen there. I think time use rates are really the next important thing for us to consider doing, especially with more EV charging, to encourage the charging to happen at night. Other questions or comments? All right, thank you, Jim. Thank you for the great presentations. Ken, Jim, thank you. We now move on to ordinance for hearing. Will the clerk please read the statement? The ordinance is scheduled for hearing. We're introduced by title and passed on a first reading at the regular meeting of the council held on January the 9th. 2023. All were posted and filed according to law, and copies were made available to general public requesting same. All right, as mentioned before, the ordinances related to general capital will have a combined hearing. Each ordinance will be voted on separately, but the hearing will be combined. That is the same as all the ordinances related to electric capital. All the other ordinances will have uh, their separate hearings. So with that, I call up I will be calling up ordinances for second reading and ask the clerk to read said ordinances by title. Ordinance 1 2023. Ordinance of the Borough of Madison repealing ordinance number 15 2022 to remove chapter uh, 1. Oops, we have that same. Um, it's chapter 23, I believe, titled Medicinal Cannabis Dispensary. Let me look on that. And so I now open the hearing for ordinance 1. Okay. Anyone wishing to comment on ordinance 1, please step forward. Remember the guidelines as before, try to keep your comments to three minutes. Uh, we do give you one minute grace period and you will be stopped at four minutes. Please announce your name, address, and write the same on the clipboard. 193. 193. 193. And so that was uh, 193 is the yeah, yeah, chapter 193. Right. Can I begin? Yes. Okay, thank you. Before I start my public comment, I would like to take a brief moment of silence for my friends from Madison who died last year due to the opioid epidemic. Ashley Benway, age uh, name and address first. Yes, Ashley Benway, age 29, died last year in Madison due to an opioid overdose. We, we, we need your name and address first. I wanted to start with a brief moment of silence, no, no, considering no, I'm sorry. how. Okay. Ma'am, you have to follow our rules. Your name and address. I, I, if you don't do that, you have to sit down. And I, I, I appreciate you really. Understood. My name is Jesse Marie Villers. I'm from Lambertville, New Jersey. Thank you. 
as you interrupted my brief moment of silence for my friends from Madison who died last year due to the opioid epidemic, Ashley Benway, age 29, and Paula Cremosi, age 32. I guess I can't take a brief moment of silence for them today because that is not within your rules. I understand that. So as I said, I'm Jesse Marie Villers from Lambertville. I'm CEO and founder of Baked by the River Dispensary and Cannabis Equity Employment. I've acted as a cannabis consultant for municipalities of Lambertville and Frenchtown. I'm also a former Madison resident and graduate of Chatham High School. I have been a medical marijuana patient since 2014 and used cannabis to help overcome a chronic pain disorder and opioid addiction. Cannabis saved my life, and I am proud to say I'm now coming up on 10 years opioid-free thanks to my medical marijuana prescription. According to the 2021 study by the British Med Medical Journal, in the United States, there is an association between municipal cannabis dispensary counts and a reduction in opioid death rates. Allowing for medicinal dispensaries in town gives an alternative option to individuals with chronic pain, patients who are struggling with cancer diagnoses, and residents with other disabilities and illnesses. By not allowing medicinal dispensaries, Madison is choosing to readily provide access to deadly opioid prescriptions while denying access to marijuana, a medication that has never killed a person. This is a tragedy and will lead to more unnecessary deaths in this town. I want I also want to specifically respond to the out-of-date and stigmatized fear tactics that I've heard being used as an argument against medical marijuana access in Madison. I have heard people concerned about their children and concerned about the potential for increased crime. To that, I would like to refer the City Council to two studies. First, according to the Youth Risk Behavior Survey conducted nationwide in 2019, marijuana use among youth does not increase and actually has been shown to decline when legal dispensaries open, as it is more difficult for teenagers to obtain marijuana when drug dealers are replaced by licensed dispensaries that require proof of age. Secondly, according to the study by the University of New Haven in 2022, it is suggested that legalization of marijuana and subsequent open of opening of dispensaries has little to no adverse effect on crime rates and actually has the potential to reduce crime rates. A statistic I also feel residents of Madison should be aware of before deciding whether or not to allow medical marijuana dispensaries is the statistic on property values. According to a study published by the Rutgers University and funded by the New Jersey State Policy Lab, the establishment of licensed cannabis businesses in a municipality is associated with increased home values. In conclusion, I encourage the City Council to consider these facts, not be swayed by outdated stigma, and table this ban to allow access to life-saving medicine to the residents of, of Madison. One minute. By allowing medicinal access, you have the potential to reduce the number of opioid deaths in Madison, reduce youth consumption, and increase property values. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments. Did you want me to write my name too? Y yes, please. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to comment? Please step forward. My name is Cord Schlobaum from Lambertville, New Jersey as well. I'm also a business associate of Jessica Villers. I am a co-founder of Cannabis Equity Employment, helped to build that platform. Um, and I'm also a member of Baked by the River. Um, I would like to just simply echo a few points that Jessica made um, because most of my prepared presentation falls within the same field. Um, property value increased taxes reduced um, harder to get cannabis in the hands of people you don't want it in the hands of easier to get it in the hands of people that need it such as veterans uh, folks that are disabled um, people that have a variety of different issues that are benefited from cannabis um, and it's going to decrease deaths of uh, many people um, Many of those that uh, we uh, I'm sorry. I'm Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments. Anyone else wishing to comment, please step forward. Thank you, Mayor and Council. My name is Mary Oaks, 60 Pemberton Avenue, Oceanport, New Jersey. 
Um, my husband was a medical marijuana user, and he was diagnosed in 2016 with stage 4 cancer. He was given two months to live. My husband lived four, four years and 10 months because of the use of medical cannabis. It kept him off of oxy, every kind of opioid they wanted to shove down him to, to keep him pain free. My husband was in the hospital in Robert Wood in 2018, and he had a liver resection, and the nurse came in the next morning and knocked on his, um, his morphine. And she said, oh, it must be broke. And he said, why? She said, there's only five units taken out of it. And he said, that's because I used my medical. He had oil that he could stick under his tongue. He did not have to take one painkiller. So with that said, I hope you guys take such good care of your residents. I just listen to everything. You have a beautiful town. Uh, my husband and I, when uh, my daughter was a senior in high school in 2016, Moore decided to come up here to Madison to go to FDU so she could be close to her dad. She was supposed to go to Virginia. Uh, she, does, she had a wonderful experience here. And not only that, the campus allowed my husband, when he came for visits, to go to the outside courtyard with their permission and allow him to use his medical marijuana. And I just want to tell you, it was a lifesaver. And at that point, there were not a lot of medical dispensaries anywhere in New Jersey. There were five or six of them. We had to take a round trip, three hours, that's without traffic, all the way down to Belmar, New Jersey, not Belmar on the shore, the one in West New Jersey. And if we were lucky, we'd get home in four hours. And it got to the point where I had to do those trips alone because my husband was just too sick to do them. So I really, really hope, with this said, that you guys, like you said, you take care of your residents, and I can see that in this town. It's beautiful. We spent from 2016 to 2020 coming up here, and we loved every moment of it. And my husband died in 2020, right after my daughter's graduation. He promised her in 2016 he'd be there. I rolled my eyes, didn't think he would. He made it. So please, please, reconsider medical. I don't care about recreational, but the medical part is very important. And it is also, like this young woman said about opiates, it's a lifesaver. And if you don't believe it, please go to these places and check them out. Everybody talks about crime. You go into a dispensary, okay. You go into a dispensary, it's like a, an upscale jewelry store. It's beautiful, it's secure, you have all um, off-duty police officers or retired police officers that are there. There's no crime. I've been, I've been in and out of them. I am a medical patient myself. I've been in and out of them. Never once has there ever, ever been trouble. That's just stigma. It's an old stigma. So please, I hope you reconsider. Thank you. Thank you for your comments and sharing your personal story. Anyone else wishing to comment on this ordinance? Please step forward. Hi, Sue Heffernan, Beverly Road. I've been up here a few times, so I'm not going to repeat everything I've said before, but I do want to say it was shown that medical-only cannabis is neither profitable nor sustainable here. With due respect to all the issues brought up, none of these people live in Madison. Um, I would also like to say the Madison-Chatham Coalition, which I mentioned last time, is a data-driven organization which has current statistics, not outdated, showing that a dispensary would increase access and decrease the perception of risk, which are two key contributors to teen substance use. So how does contributing to teen substance use fit with families who want to raise children in a safe and healthy environment? My last point is Colorado is 10 years ahead of us in this industry and suffering many ill effects from it. Why are we not considering the risks and ramifications? There are many more reasons not to have it in this community than there are to introduce it. So please vote, as we have repeatedly asked, to prohibit cannabis, cannabis dispensaries in Madison, New Jersey. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. A anyone else wishing to comment? Please step forward. 
Hi, my name is uh, Devin Carwithin. I live at 3 Sampson Avenue in Madison. Um, to be honest with you, a lot of the, uh, the negative parts of all this seem like it comes from a place of fear um, and lack of understanding. Uh, especially if it's just for medical marijuana, I don't see how any kind of, uh, any kind of a, a place would uh, increase crime or anything like that. If it's purely for medical, no one could go in recreationally and use it, so there wouldn't be the same sort of traffic or anything like that. Honestly, I think it's kind of hypocritical to allow, what, four or five different uh, bars and, and liquor stores to sell liquor here, when if you were to actually bring it up to the FDA, I don't think liquor could pass the FDA standards right now for a, a, something that can be consumed healthily Compared to cannabis, it's, it's just, it's night and day. You can, you can go out right now to a bar down the street, drink as much as you want, get into a car and kill somebody, and yet you go and smoke some cannabis, you're not going to kill anybody, you're not going to abuse your wife, you're not going to, like these are all things that are, I think are a little absurd to be so afraid of when it's something that is a medicine that helps people, when it, when it has never killed a single person, ever. I mean, this is like reefer madness insanity. We're trying to make a plant into a monster when it is literally a plant. Okay, uh, that's all, thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for writing it down. Anyone else wish to comment? Hi, Council. My name is Caitlin Santora, Niles Avenue. This will be my third time speaking. Dispensaries, um, regarding dispensaries in our town, there's not much more to say. Just a reminder, Chatham, Summit, Florham Park, Morris Township, all banned dispensaries. Another reminder, last month, Town Hall, and even its overflow room, was filled with residents opposing a dispensary in Madison. There was a petition signed by almost a thousand people who were from Madison and some non-residents who care deeply for our town and its, and its residents and greatly oppose any dispensary in town. You need medicinal marijuana or if you just choose to smoke weed, pop gummies, go for it. Luckily, there are dispensaries in Maplewood, eight miles away, Union, seven miles away, Montclair, 11 miles away, two in Randolph, 10 miles away, Bloomfield, Woodbridge, Elizabeth, you get it. Um, I go to my doctor in Morristown. I bring my son to the pediatrician in New Providence, six miles away. If it's important enough, you'll get in your car and travel. Uh, in this, please. Is this person, he's just recording me? I don't know who this person we, we, is. We, we have to permit that, but we, we, okay. we, we will not tolerate reaction okay, great. Uh, to our two speakers. Great. Sounds good. Um, in the state of New Jersey, it is legal to get marijuana delivered if you have a medicinal card. We discussed and you all agreed that any medicinal dispensary here in town will not survive without it turning recreational. I'm not sure if I'm back in the twilight zone or if there's actually someone in attendance here tonight in a huge purple bong costume with a guitar. While some people here think dressing up laughing, singing. Excuse me, sir. You don't interrupt and put your phone down. You're not sitting there taping on her face. You already talked to. Ma'am, go on. I'm going to repeat that sentence. In attendance here tonight, in a huge purple bong costume with a guitar, while some people here think dressing up, laughing and singing, making a joke of this is appropriate. I find it insulting that a town hall meeting voting on such an important and serious issue is being turned into a circus. I have faith in this council that you will continue to take this issue seriously for those who genuinely care and live in our town. Thank you. Thank you very much, Caitlin. Anyone else wishing to comment, please step forward. I'd like to comment. We can get, we, 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 yeah, we can get you a wireless. Thank you. My name is Edward Lefty Grimes. I'm with TheChiefAcross.org. We're a 501c3 here in New Jersey fighting for disorder rights, cannabis patients' rights. This is a, uh, an award 
from Senator Cody, Senator Sweeney, for our work with disabled people. It's a joint resolution. Uh, this is a uh, congressional award for our work with disabled. So, yeah, we may be clowns, but we're very serious about helping the sick and dying. You can pass that along and keep that. It's very serious. The disrespect of disabled vets will not be tolerated. It's absolutely disgusting. Uh, the fact that I couldn't get in this building before uh, is disgusting. You're putting the last last. You don't even consider people in wheelchairs in this room, which is absolutely disgusting. Disabled vets are not even thought about. Kennedy, if you just, uh, there's a three-inch brass door that I had to get through to get into this building. That's how disabled vets are treated in this town. Three-inch brass door where the button is broken. The button's broken. I can't even get into this building. Shameful treat of disabled vets, sick and dying people. So yeah, I'm not surprised that you wouldn't ban medicine. I'm not surprised that that came up because there is no love for disabled vets in this town. I'm in severe pain. I have an artificial disc. I have two level fusion. I should be having this meeting right now on a Zoom meeting, but this meeting violates Title II, and your borough attorney should know this if he's worth his money. This meeting violates Title II of the ADA. When you take away disab disability rights, you have a process. You didn't follow anything in that process. You gave these rights for 19 months to healthy people. You gave us Zoom meetings for healthy people. Now disabled vets and other sick people need those meetings, and you took them away without the right process. There's no question and answer period, no grievance procedure. Where's your, uh, where's your uh, handicap coordinator? Do you even have one? No. We wouldn't even be here if you were banning recreational. I could care less if you banned recreational. Sometimes I've done that. We've been to towns that have done that. You want to ban medicine? You've got a big problem. You're going to get a lot of vets out here. So, uh, I'm, I wish we met a man named Bob. He's in a wheelchair. And he talks... The way he communicates, he has a fork or a stick on his head. And he actually specks at a screen to speak to other human beings. How are we not doing everything we can for people like Bob in his wheelchair? How are we not doing everything for people that are suffering and sick? Spend a day in a wheelchair. I tell every council to do this, and not one council person has taken me up on this. Spend a day in a wheelchair, and including your attorney especially your attorney. Spend the day in a wheelchair and see how you feel about people in wheelchairs. Maybe you might change your mind. Leave the man you want to go back for the one. Didn't you learn that? Didn't Jesus teach you to learn? Leave the man you want to go back for the one? Perking up over here. There he was, a Christian. Leave the man you want to go back for the one. I hope someday the entire herd of man goes back for the one. But we can't get one to go back for the one. One minute. You sell fentanyl in this town. That's fine, family, so I'm no problem with fentanyl being sold. How many overdoses have you had in this town from fentanyl? I can tell you the answer. You ask your police chief. A hundred. You had a hundred people die from fentanyl last year in this town. But you continue to sell it. You keep selling fentanyl. No problem with that. It's family friendly. Denying the sick and dying. They're, the denying people their medicine is anti-Christian, anti-human. And it's disgusting. Absolutely disgusting. Please spend a day in a wheelchair. God is watching you. If God would do us a job, and God would kill Jesus, what's God going to do to somebody who's hurting poor my first friend who pecks at his computer with her head? What is he going to do to you for hurting him? You should be helping him and helping the sick and dying of this town. Shame on you for even considering banning medicine. They shall grow not old as we that are left grow old. That is, that is time. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to comment? Please step forward. Wow. <clears throat> My name is Bong Holio. The spelling of that is B O N G H O L E L E O. Okay? The first thing we're going to do, this wasn't the plan, but the first thing we're going to do I, is going to give up. Uh, yeah, I'm a bong. You can find it on any coffee table across the sir, state or the country. The sir, first thing we're going to do... Your th address. That is policy. That is not law. Yeah. I am here, okay? And I'm ready to give a presentation. Yeah. The first thing we're going to do is properly acknowledge Jessica's friend from Madison who overdosed on opiates with a moment of silence without you people acting like children. Moment of silence for Jessica's friend who died of opiates in Madison. Unreal. And you're worried about me snickering and you allowed this, this woman to pick me apart. But that's okay. 
Very <laughs> good. The well, the thing is this. I wouldn't be here either if this was recreational, okay? But I go around. I've been to 50 towns all across the state talking about medical cannabis, okay? And you, you're going to take away medicine? You're going to take what you're going to be? You're going to be in a song, okay? So we got a song here for you, okay? And you're going to be in it. Take away medicine. Can't believe what you did to our poor friend. What a childlike move that was. I've been to over 50 towns I've never seen adults act like children. I don't know what that was, but that, that's why you got a snicker out of me. You can't get no weed here. 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 Over by the Keep your cancer homes here. You can't get no weed. Party in Berkeley, Bridgeton, Bridgewater, Cricket Team, Cross, that Chatham, Clifton, Cranberry, East Rutherford, Elmwood Park, and sit there, Green Tree, Holy Park, and Burke Heights, all fall in love with Moe. Dot James Burke has them all on. You can't get no weed here. 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 Keep your pants or hold here. You can't get no weed. Who's going to throw you the song? No medicine in Madison, where it must be. Hell and cold to open most of the Ridgewood, Greenwood, Seaside High. See your truth, very sea, coffee, sir, city, spot, two, a free, hold up your side of the wall. And wait, you can't get no weed here. 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 Keep your pants at home, dear. You can't get no weed. We hold my cold out. You can't get no weed here. 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 Keep your wheelchair home here. You can't get no weed. You can't get no weed here. 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 Please don't show my face. Sorry. Please don't show Come my face. Ma'am, no, sir, sir, you're meeting. interrupting the speakers. You're not you're interrupting me. I'm sitting here. Sitting yeah. here. Sir, turn off your phone and taping her. You're not supposed I'm to. Allowed to you're allowed to tape a meeting, but you can sit back there and tape. You're not supposed to be in somebody's face. So I'm sir, over here sir, my chair. Could get back? I'm stuck over here because you have no tape over here. There's no tape on the floor, so I can't get away from you because my wheelchair can't get over this hump right here. So there you go. There you go. I, I'm stuck here. This meeting, the, the the speaker asked you not to have your phone in her face while she well, speaks. She has to your order, but I'm going to be actually. Could you please not put the phone up as close as you have it? Whatever. My name is Diane Wood, and I live on Essex Place. This is probably, doesn't have a lot, but I'm going to just say it anyway. I've been here once before, and I want to thank the council for considering the things that they've heard said by the town of people of Madison. In introducing these new ordinances, I believe you've listened to what the people so far have asked you. We have a little more work to do. The vote tonight is just as important as every other meeting that has been held. A lot of people here are saying that by not allowing this in Madison, you're taking the right of people to have this medical marijuana away. I don't believe that's what we're doing in Madison. I personally spoke to the town administrator in Morristown. The, the, the dispensary in Morristown is going forward. It won't be 11 miles away. 
it won't be seven miles away. It'll be less than five. As this one woman said earlier, she takes her child to the doctor in Morristown. If we need to go to the hospital, we go to the hospital in Morristown. It is close enough. It is accessible. I hope that you all continue to consider the people of Madison and how they feel about this. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to uh, comment, please step forward. Seeing none, I close the hearing. Mayor, I move ordinance 1-2023. Second. Any council discussion? Roll call vote, please. Mr. Hoover? Yes. Ms. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Ehrlich? Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mr. Range? Yes. Mr. Harold Pudis? Yes. I declare ordinance. Yes. I'm sorry. I declare ordinance 1-2023, uh, adopted and finally passed. And ask the clerk to publish notice there of a newspaper and file the ordinance according to the law. Ordinance 2 2023. Ordinance of the Borough of Madison repealing Ordinance 18 2022 to reinstate the former zone of the CC Community Commercial Zone and the Gateway Zone prohibiting medicinal cannabis dispensaries. I open the hearing on Ordinance 2, which is uh, on zoning. Anyone wishing related to cannabis, anyone wishing to comment, please step forward. Uh, hi everyone, uh, Rachel from Niles Ave. Um, I just wanted to consider if you guys do vote to resent, or I guess whichever way it goes, vote yes, I guess, um, for the dispensary that if it does ever get called back into question to consider uh, looking more in depth into the zoning requirements for the location um, and how it can directly affect residential properties that are in the gateway zone. Um, as being a residential property that directly ab abutted the license that got denied. Uh, it was a very difficult situation to be in, and it was scary from our perspective. Um, and I think that th taking that into consideration, and I want to make sure that that doesn't have to happen to any of the other residents in town. Um, so just trying to find a location that makes sense and doesn't affect other residents in the way that it could have affected us. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to comment, please step forward. Second ordinance. Hello, my name is... The state name and again... I'm doing process. that, yes. My name is Jesse Marie Villers. I'm from Lambertville, New Jersey. I'd like to take another moment of silence for Madison residents that died from the opioid epidemic in the last five years. Julia Sickler, Clifford Glashler. These were friends of mine who died because they had access to opioid prescriptions instead of a cannabis prescription. I also want to address, because I, I realize that this is specifically on zoning, and determining where cannabis dispensaries can be zoned appropriately within a town is incredibly important. I wanted to address the incredibly ableist comments from some of the members of the audience talking about how there are dispensaries opening in Morristown. There are dispensaries in Montclair. As someone who was a medicinal marijuana patient as of 2014 because of chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy, I used a mobility scooter for a matter of five years in order to just be able to get around. I was not able to drive myself anywhere. I was not able to drive myself to the medicinal dispensary to be able to get my prescription. And having that access in the same way that we have access to fentanyl and opioids at any of the pharmacies here in town. That is all we're asking, is for people who have prescriptions from their doctors to be able to access their medicine in their hometown. I wasn't able to do that. Instead, I had to find people that would drive me. And it wasn't always, I, I could not always make it work. And so I spent a lot of time in chronic pain because I did not have access to a car to be able to drive myself to that dispensary. So it's incredibly ableist to say that because a dispensary exists in a few towns over, you have access to it. No, people with disabilities might not. Um, I also want to reference the new dispensaries that is coming to Morristown because I get there was a lot of concern and there was a mention about a study about the increase of youth um, usage of cannabis. Um, and I am actually very familiar with that study. Uh, it is not 
relevant to medicinal cannabis. It's not relevant to medicinal cannabis dispensaries. And that is what this conversation is about today. So I'd like, again, to refer the City Council to the Youth Risk Survey of, as of 2019 that was specific around medicinal cannabis um, because it actually does reduce youth rates within the town when cannabis dispensaries open. Um, and to think that not allowing a medicinal dispensary in town is going to reduce the, number, the amount of cannabis being bought in that town is just ignorant. Um, because there will be delivery services coming from Morristown, delivering cannabis to every sidewalk, every please, please doorway, um, any place in Madison. And so you will be getting regular recreational marijuana sales on every street in Madison, but Madison won't be getting the tax revenue, and Madison won't have control over where those cannabis dispensaries open or what kind of cannabis businesses you allow. And so by not allowing an ordinance for cannabis in this town, you're getting rid of your own control and you're getting rid of the potential for tax revenue for this town to be able to address things like addiction issues, to be able to fund police responses to addiction issues, to be able to fund your schools. It's just a lot of benefits and very few consequences. And you're specifically hurting people with disabilities by not allowing this ordinance to, by not allowing medicinal cannabis access in this town. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Justin. Anyone else wishing to comment on this ordinance? Sue Heffernan, Beverly Road. Just one comment on zoning we discussed last time. I think I mentioned the Paramus commercial zone, and that's appropriate. We don't feel there's any appropriate zoning here. Um, maybe I'm ignorant, but I don't understand why people from Lawrenceville, who's located down by Princeton and are talking about not wanting to travel far, are so concerned about us having it here. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to comment? Please step forward. Seeing none, I close the hearing. Yeah. I'm wheeling forward. Okay. Yep. Uh, Lefty Grimes, TivaCross.org, 501c3 here in uh, New Jersey, fighting for uh, the ignorance that we just heard. Uh, I'd like to ask you it's easy to spend a day in a wheelchair. Maybe it's the first time we should see it in a wheelchair. Let me go around and, 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 and it's only asked to spend a day in a wheelchair. Please direct comments. Yeah, I'm going to direct it towards you. Why don't you spend a day in a wheelchair too and see how you like it? How about you, how about you pick out a, a screen in your head and see how you like it? Nobody's helping you. How about you, Barry Attorney? I bet you'll be showing you guys how you like through your door and through your lack of access to Zoom means because I should be home right now watching this on Zoom. And, and, and this is ridiculous because you're violating Title II of the ADA. You're violating the, the ADA by not having access. And you're violating, just violating human rights by not having medicine available to sick people. you got people in wheelchairs that can't get out, that have no money. They would expect them to get in the car and just go somewhere. How far do you expect someone to rear themselves in a wheelchair? How far? Please address your comments. How far do you want them to rear to how far can you how far can you go in a wheelchair? Not too far, can you? It's not fun. It's not fun. I got a electric wheelchair. I'm talking about the ones that you gotta push, where you get glass on your hands, when you have the glass, you get dog poop on your hands when you get the dog poop. Things that you gotta realize. There's some new stations that we have no hidden access in New Jersey. It's called institutional ableism. Post offices in New Jersey without access. Police stations, libraries, all, all kinds of stuff. You do research on us and you'll see we're not joking around. We're here for a reason because you guys are ableists. You guys are hurting the sick and the dying and we're calling you out on it. And we're going to sue you. Get your attorney ready because we're going to sue you. You guys, you have to drop the ball. You're the worst city attorney ever. Ever. And we're going to prove it. Disgusting display of Christianity and anything that I've ever seen. Awful. Putting the left first. They shall grow not old, as we that are left grow old. Age shall not rule them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. Thanks for nothing. How are you, Madison? This is me unbonged. Okay. Sir, your name and your address. Again, that's policy. That's not a law. It is. I believe in my right for privacy, and I don't want to be discriminated on where I live geographically. Sir. All of the finger pointing that's been going on about direct me, direct that. You let that lady direct me and make fun of me because of the way I was looking. You let her discriminate against me, all of you. You all let it happen. You let this happen, and you stopped every other finger point. 
You did that. I watched you do it. I watched all of you act like children. When poor Jessica was acknowledging her friend from Madison who died of an opiate overdose here in Madison. Because that's a Madison issue. But what did we do? We acted like children. I've been in so many towns. I've never saw that. I never saw that. But you know what she did? She got you. We know why you're freaking out. We know why you're scared. We know what you're, what you're trying to hide. The opiate epidemic. That's what you're trying to hide. You want to sweep that under the rug. And you want to ban medicine that cannot kill you. And you want to trash talk people who are not from the town. And you look different. And you wear clothes that's funny. It's all circus to you. You guys are all children. Sir. All right? Children are not ignorant like you guys. All right? And I'm allowed to say whatever I want. I'm not breaking the law. Okay? So you can have this whole policy strong harm thing. Or you know what? It, this is going to be really, not gonna be, the pain that you put on patients by banning medicine can't compare the pain that you guys are experiencing right now. Oh no! You, you may, you're allowed to film. Stop! Uh, this is my, this is my moment. Please, please, let me have my moment. Why do you keep interrupting. Please, okay. I've been interrupted plenty of times. All the pain you want to put on patients. And you're worried about the pain for the four minutes. Sir, you, you guys are out of control. The bottom line is you didn't give us your name or your address. You keep on addressing. What law have I broken? Sir, this is called the Open Public Meeting Act, and we set the rules for and that protects me. discussion. What's I don't have to. I have privacy rights. I do not have to tell you where I live. I do not have to discri I do not have to choose to be You're discriminated. Incorrect. You're incorrect, sir. The, the bottom line is. Well, this was my. This was. Mr. Grimes, if you stopped, we could have helped you. Help me out. We're going to get that. that. Stop a second. Okay. Thank you. I think we've lost our uh, microphone there. We did. We lost the uh, wireless. Anyone else wishing to uh, comment? Please step forward. as far as I'm concerned, I earn the right to be here, okay? People from out of town, I don't appreciate, and I don't like I'm a new owner. Uh, 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 John, John, you, yes. must, you must the only council. address the council. Yes. Sir, excuse me. Lefty, back up. You're interrupting people. Back up. He just interrupted. You know what? Let's get the police in here. I'm going to get the police in here because you're so... Should I hit the button? They're, 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 they're yeah. Tom. All right, I'm, I'm sorry, John. I'm alarmed that people who don't even live here can come in here and twice get a chance to speak, not even speak, just be rude to everybody who have already expressed their desire not to have this in town. And I say this is just an example of the kind of rudeness that's going to continue with this kind of attitude from people out of town coming here that we don't need. They can get their drugs or whatever they want somewhere else, okay? They can do that somewhere else. And I'm proud to be here. And so I just, I'm glad I'm here. And every day I'm here, I thank God that I am here. So thank you, sir. Thank you. And you want to meet, okay? It's a It does. Uh, Mr. Mr. Grimes, you cannot speak right now. Anyone else wishing to comment, please step forward. Um, here we are again. Uh, over three hearings, multiple emails and petitions, Madison residents have shown up and voiced their against medical and recreational cannabis dispensaries within Madison. Here today, we still only have one Madison resident stepping up in support. The council has shown the math is a pencil for medical, and Madison has consistently stated they are against re recreational. In response to the zero deaths, weeks ago we had a horrific crash on 24 due to a man driving high during the morning rush. It's not not happening. I implore you to put this issue to bed by voting to prevent cannabis dispensaries within Madison. I'd also like to propose an ordinance blocking individual recordings of these meetings to ensure the safety of Madison residents, many of whom have left because they feared for their safety walking home tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to comment, please step forward. Seeing none, I close the hearing. Mayor, I move ordinance 2-2023. Second. Any council discussion? 
Roll call vote, please. Mr. Hoover? Yes. Ms. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Herlick? Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mr. Range? Yes. Mr. Aaron Potus? Yes. I declare Ordinance 2 2023 adopted and finally passed and ask the clerk to publish notice there of the newspaper and file the ordinance according to the law. Ordinance 3 2023. Ordinance of the Borough of Madison repealing Ordinance 39 2022 to remove med medicinal cannabis dispensary permit application. I open the hearing for Ordinance 3. Anyone wishing to comment on Ordinance 3? This is on the permit process. Please step forward. Seeing none, I close the hearing. Mayor, I move Ordinance 3 2023. Second. Any council discussion? Roll call vote, please. Mr. Hoover? Yes. Ms. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Herlick? Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mr. Range? Yes. Mr. Harold Pudis? Yes. I declare Ordinance 3 2023 adopted and finally passed and ask the clerk to publish notice there of the newspaper and file the ordinance according to the law. Uh, before we go on to the next hearing, I would like a uh, motion to extend the meeting to 11.15. So moved. Second. Right. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. 11.05. Let's go. I don't know if we want to go in the hall. Five minutes. So we, uh, I will ask that Ordinance 4 and Addish Ordinance 13 be read by title. And just again, we will uh, have a single hearing and vote on these separately. Ordinance 4, 2023, Ordinance of the Borough of Madison, appropriating $300,000 from the Electric Capital Improvement Fund for the water and light plant roof replacement. I open the hearing for Ordinance 4 and, I'm sorry, I also Three need the 13. title, Ordinance 13, which is a couple of pages back, which I had to give Liz the yes. to. <laughs> Ordinance 13, 2023, Ordinance of the Borough of Madison, appropriating $150,000 from the Electric Capital Improvement Fund for the 2023 Cook Avenue parking lot reconstruction project. So now I open the hearing for both Ordinance 4 and Ord Ordinance 13. If anyone wants to comment in either one or both, please step forward. Seeing none, I close the hearing. I ask for a motion for Ordinance 4, which is the um, roof replacement. Mayor, I move Ordinance 4 2023. Second. And uh, again, any council discussion? Roll call vote, please. Mr. Hoover? Yes. Ms. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Early? Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mr. Range? Yes. Mr. Harold Pudis? Yes. I declare Ordinance 4. 2013 adopted and finally passed and ask the clerk to publish notice their newspaper and file the ordinance accordance with the law. Now, ordinance 13 2023 may I have a motion. Mayor, I move ordinance 13 2023. Second. And this is the 150,000 electric utility for Cook Avenue parking lot. Any council discussion? Roll call vote please. Mr. Hoover? Yes. Ms. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Herlick? Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mr. Range? Yes. Mr. Harold Pudis? Yes. I declare Ordinance 13 2023 adopted and finally passed and ask the clerk to publish notice there in, thereof in the newspaper and file the ordinance in accordance with the law. We now will have the um, hearings for Ordinance 5, 6, 7, 8, 11, and 12. So I will ask the clerk to please read through his ordinance by title. Ordinance 5. Ordinance of the Borough of Madison appropriating $206,000 from the General Capital Improvement Fund for final payments and change orders for the Hartley Dodge Memorial Plaza construction work. Ordinance 6. Ordinance of the Borough of Madison appropriating $40,000 from the General Capital Improvement Fund for the Memorial Park Footbridge Repair Project. Ordinance 7. Ordinance of the Borough of Madison appropriating $464,000 from the General Capital Improvement Fund for the 2023 Sewer Main Lining Repair and Rehabilitation Construction Project. Ordinance 8. Ordinance of the Borough of Madison appropriating $750,000 from the General Capital Improvement Fund for the 2023 Mill and Overlay Resurfacing Projects. Ordinance 11. Ordinance of the Borough of Madison appropriating $21,000 from the General Capital Improvement Fund for the purchase of a Luca Chess Compression System. And Ordinance 12. Ordinance of the Borough of Madison appropriating $650,000 from the General Capital Improvement Fund for the 2023 Cook Avenue parking lot reconstruction project. I now open the hearing for ordinances 5, 6, 7, 8, 11, and 12. If you, anyone wishing to comment on any of those ordinances or all as a whole, please step forward. 
Seeing none, I close the hearing. I may have a motion for Ordinance 5-2023. Mayor, I move Ordinance 5-2023. Second. Any council discussion? Roll call vote, please. Mr. Hoover? Yes. Ms. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Herlick? Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mr. Range? Yes. Mr. Harold Putis? Yes. I declare Ordinance 5 uh, dash 2023 adopt and finally pass and ask the clerk to publish notice there in the newspaper filing ordinance in accordance with the law. Ordinance 6. I have a motion. 6. Mayor, I move Ordinance 6 dash 2023. Second. Appropriation for the footbridge. Any council discussion? No. Roll call vote, please. Mr. Hoover? Yes. Ms. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Herlick? Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mr. Range? Yes. Mr. Harold Putis? Yes. I declare Ordinance 6 2023 adopted and finally passed and ask the clerk to publish notice there in the newspaper and file the ordinance in accordance with the law. Ordinance 7 2023. Mayor, Mayor, I move Ordinance 7 2023. Second. And this is the uh, sewer main lining repair. Any um, council discussion? Roll call vote, please. Mr. Hoover? Yes. Ms. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Hurley? Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mr. Range? Yes. Mr. Harold Putis? Yes. I declare Ordinance 7 2023 adopted and finally passed. And I ask the clerk to publish notice of the newspaper and file the ordinance in accordance with the law. Ordinance 8 um, 2023, may I have a motion? Mayor, I move Ordinance 8 2023. Second. This is 750,000 for mill and overlay. Any council discussion? Roll call vote, please. Mr. Hoover? Yes. Ms. Cohen? She just walked out. She just walked out. Okay. Ms. Ehrlich? Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mr. Range? Yes. Mr. Harold Putis? Yes. I declare Ordinance 8 2023 adopted and finally passed and ask the clerk to publish notice there in the newspaper and file an ordinance with accordance with the law. May I have ordinance, a motion for Ordinance 11 2023? May I move Ordinance 11 2023? I second the ordinance. And this is 21,004 Lucas Chest Compression System. Any council discussion? Roll call vote, please. Mr. Hoover? Yes. Ms. Ehrlich? Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mr. Range? Yes. Mr. Harold Putis? Yes. I declare Ordinance 11 2023 adopted and finally passed and ask the clerk to publish notice there in the newspaper and file the ordinance in accordance with the law. Now I ask for a motion for Ordinance 12 2023. 12? Who's doing 12? Uh, Mayor, did we skip Ordinance nine. 10? And 9. Uh, yeah, t t 10 is not one of the, uh, that's where you have to do a separate hearing on that one. Okay, I'm sorry. We're still going through our yeah, we're still combined that. hearing. Okay, I apologize. I move Ordinance 12-2023. Second. And this is uh, $650,000 for the Cook Avenue parking lot. Any council discussion? Roll call vote, please. Mr. Hoover? Yes. Ms. Ehrlich? Yes. Mr. Lindrigan? <coughs> yes. Mr. Range? Yes. Mr. Harlan Poudre? Yes. I declare Ordinance 10, I mean order, Ordinance 12 dash 2023 adopted and finally passed and ask the clerk to publish notice there of in, in the newspaper. And uh, but now we are um, nine. on number nine, Here. which is uh, Ordinance 9 2023 by title, please. Ordinance of the Borough of Madison appropriating $240,000 <coughs> from the Open Space Recreation and Historic Preservation Trust Fund for the MRC Basketball Pickleball Court Construction project. I open the hearing for Ordinance 9-2023. Anyone wish to comment, please step forward. Seeing none, may I have a motion? I make a motion, Mayor. Okay. Second. And uh, any council discussion? Bob? I, after all the fun that we've had to, here tonight, I just have something really short to say. Dutch, we did it. <laughs> You're in. Good stuff. <laughs> all your work touch and patience any further discussion roll call vote please mr hoover yes Ms. Ehrlich. yes mr landrigan yes mr range yes mr harlan putus yes i declare ordinance 9-2023 adopted and finally passed i ask the clerk to publish notice there of the newspaper and follow the ordinance with accordance with the law ordinance 10-2023 Ordinance of the Borough of Madison amending Chapter 16 Environmental Commission to add non-voting associate members and student members to the Environmental Commission. I open hearing for Ordinance 10-2023. Anyone wish to comment, please step forward. Claire. Welcome. 
Is it the same? Uh, clear with Cup 12 Fairway Road. I just want to thank the council for uh, considering this ordinance. It's a uh, model by Lawrence Township. It's a very successful model of expanding the all of the environment, and I think it will be really successful in that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for bringing it to, to our attention. Any other further comments? I close, I close the hearing. Mayor, I move Ordinance 10-2023. Second. Second. <laughs> Any council Mr. discussion? Jeff. We'll call a vote, please. Mr. Hoover? Yes. Ms. Ehrlich? Yes. Mr. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mr. Range? Yes. Mr. Harlan Poudis? Yes. I declare Ordinance 10-2023 adopted and finally passed, and I ask the clerk to publish notice there of the newspaper and file the ordinance according to the law. We now move on to our second of uh, two invitations for public comment. Any wishing to comment on any topic may uh, step forward. The same rules apply. Please state your name, address, and try to keep your comments three minutes, but we do give you that one minute grace. Absolutely. Um, hi, my name is Christine Clark. I live at 20 Florida out in Lake Apacong. Um, I just wanted to thank the governing body and Councilwoman Ehrlich so much, as well as the Climate Action Ad Hoc Committee, um, for their important work on municipal leadership on climate change. Um, I remember when I, as a mother of two at the time, I now have four, uh, had found out about how serious climate change was and how quickly the earth was warming. And I went outside, it was during the winter, and took a two-minute recording of snow because I didn't know if my grandchildren would ever see it. Um, I was born at 336 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Um, one year ago at this time, we were facing 417 parts per million. We're now up to 419. The curve is accelerating, and um, one doesn't have to agree with anyone's politics to agree that this is a serious issue, and it needs to be dealt with. Um, there's no time like the present. Um, as the councilwoman had mentioned, the Inflation Reduction Act gives rebates on everything from electric vehicles to heat pumps um, to replacing your stove at home. You can get a tax credit for switching to an electric stove, whether it's a wall oven or a, um, you know, a range or a cooktop. Um, and so, you know, not only for the climate benefits, but for the health benefits as well. Um, the Consumer Product Safety Commission just released a report that said that 12.7 of national asthma cases are caused by gas stoves, that they leak even when they're not on. So, you know, as someone who has a child with asthma, this is a great concern to me as well. Um, but more importantly, I think that when we see our representatives at the municipal level speak to national issues, state issues, by showing leadership, um, you know, there's a saying that you want change to come from the ground up, um, but the, the issue of dealing with climate is such a popular issue across partisan lines, across populations, um, that you know, this kind of leadership really shows people that they can have faith in our democracy, that they can put people in place who will do the work that we need them to do on a timeline that we need. Um, and so I wanted to thank you very much personally for getting this done, for putting these reports out there, for developing a plan, and for the important and time-consuming and lengthy work that went into that. Um, I deeply, personally appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you much. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to comment, please step forward. Touch. Chris Holland, uh, Locust Street in Madison. I, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't, uh, by the way, thanks for the shout out earlier, um, if I didn't use this time to say thanks, right? A lot of people come down on the council tonight. Um, on behalf of the Madison Basketball Association and the Board of Trustees and um, the Madison Recreational Committee, um, I'd like to thank council for passing Ordinance 9. Um, the appropriation of the funds from the open space uh, for the open space court or the, the new multi-sport court is going to be a really nice addition to Madison. Uh, personally, I'd like to thank the mayor um, for his stewardship through the project, Councilman Landrigan uh, for support on the Recreation Advisory Committee, Councilman Harold Potus for his guidance before and during when he was in office, um, Mr. Burnett and Mr. Vogel. Um, from the borough for their help in the project presentation and the planning part. Uh, Dave Carver uh, at the advisory committee uh, for recreation, he kept us on the agenda, kept us thinking about it. Um, I'd like to thank the, the NBA board who backed me wholeheartedly and uh, for a bunch of guys that started this uh, conceptually, Marty Horn, Charlie Horsey, and Pat Deneen, who started the journey with me 
uh, back in October of 2020. So it's been a long time. Um, but um, I just want to end with some stats. We had 1,185 signatures on the original petition. The Madison basketball community is now over 600 families. And there's 800 and I think 81 current members registered for pickleball in Madison. So um, I think this project's going to be great. I'm really excited about it. I can't tell you how many other people are excited about it. So thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Sometimes good things come to those away, right? So thanks again, guys. And thanks again for your uh, patience and uh, dedication and hard work. Making that happen. Anyone else wishing to comment, please step forward. Welcome, Judy. Good evening, Judy Kroll, 27 Laurel Way. Um, I'm here for Friends of the Drew Forest, and I promise that I'm going to be very brief and I'm not going to sing tonight. So that's probably a relief at this point. Um, Friends of the Drew Forest was thrilled to receive a special video released by Dr. Douglas Tallamy, in which he calls Drew Forest, quote, an excellent example of publicly accessible homegrown national park. For anyone that's not familiar with Dr. Tallamy's work, He's a nationally recognized entomologist, a wildlife ecologist, the author of several books, including Nature's Best Hope, and is co-founder of the Homegrown National Park Movement. On the Homegrown website, Dr. Tallamy points out that the power and responsibility of Earth's stewardship resides in the individual, each one of us. Well, that's a big responsibility. But the website itself is a stunning resource that demonstrates how we can take immediate zero cost actions to do just that. In the video, Dr. Tallamy recounts the biodiversity restoration of the Drew Forest, which exactly mirrors the kind of work he advocates we all undertake. He says the forest is, quote, a model that shows homeowners what they can create if they remove invasives and plant natives in their own yards. Protecting natural areas is a critical part of slowing the insect and bird declines that we hear about and these declines threaten the viability of the ecosystems that we all depend on. He concludes, quote, it's extremely important that all parties come together to preserve the Drew Forest because its 53 acre, acres compromise an urban forest of exceptional value. We have the video um, on our website. It's live. We're distributing it. Friends of the Drew Forest.org, and you can see the video there. It's also on our Facebook and Instagram pages. So thank you very much. Thank you for your work and thank you for sticking out to bring us that update. Anyone else wishing to comment, please step forward. Are you seeing this one? Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, Kathleen Cacavalli, 82 Central Avenue. Um, I guess first I want to thank the council for appropriating money to fix the bridge in Memorial Park. Last time I rode over it on my mountain bike, I wondered if I was going to get back across. <laughs> um, I am, of course, supporting, urging you to adopt the recommendation, the goals for the Climate Action Plan. And But I have a couple of questions. I see Deb's not here anymore. I had a couple of questions on the um, Dodge Field Playground presentation. The first one being um, what the effect of the mulch does to the durability and longevity of the rubber surface as the mulch gets tracked by people going into that area back onto the rubber. My second question is um, whether any of the benches will be in the shade will be in, in, in shade now that trees are being removed because the plan showed the benches um, in the area that didn't have any shade. And I can't imagine parents wanting to spend a lot of time in hot boiling sun watching their kids play. My third question is whether any of the benches for the playground area and the benches and the, and the uh, picnic tables that Zach is going to provide from the rec department will be made of recycled materials and or be recyclable 
I do note that some of the benches that have been put around town have a percentage of recyclable, recycled material in them and will be recyclable. The black benches that we have in town. And my fourth question is, um, someone referred to a parks master plan and someone referred to a parks plan and I'm not aware that parks has a master plan and so my question is, is that publicly available on the website that I can access? Thank you. Thank you. So we'll, um, we will get those an answers to you um, or follow up a future council meeting so the uh, impact on the mulch on the rubber, the benches in the shade, uh, the benches made of recycling, recycling uh, materials and uh, we are in the process of updating the parks master plan. So that, that one I can answer. Any, anyone else wishing to comment, please step forward. Seeing none, I close this part of the meeting. We now go on introdu introduction of ordinances. Will the clerk please read the statement? Mayor, can I move that we extend the meeting to 1130? Yeah, I just looked at my watch. <laughs> you know, 20 minutes ago, my watch said it was bedtime, but... Uh, all, second. Do I have a second? Second. second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Can, will the clerk please read the statement? The ordinance scheduled for first reading has a hearing date set for February the 13th, 2023, will be published in the Madison Eagle, post on the bulletin board, and made available to members of the public requesting copies. I call up uh, Ordinance 14-2023 for first reading. I ask the clerk to read said ordinance by title. Ordinance 14-2023, Ordinance of the Borough of Madison, appropriating $85,000 from the General Capital Improvement Fund to purchase a mason dump truck and accessories for the public works department mayor i move ordinance 14-2023 second any council discussion roll call vote please mr hoover yes Ms. Ehrlich. yes mr landrigan yes mr range yes mr. harlan putis yes all right we move on to consent agenda resolutions will the clerk please read the uh, statement Consent agenda resolutions will be enacted with a single motion. Any resolution requiring expenditure is supported by a certification of availability of funds. Any resolution requiring discussion will be removed from the consent agenda. All resolutions will be reflected, reflected in full in the minutes. Mayor, I move uh, agenda resolutions 51-2023 through 62-2023. Any discussion or any that need to be pulled? We'll call a vote, please. We need a second. I'll I'm second. I'm I'm second. Thank you. <laughs> we we yes. have a second there. Now, uh, any that need to be pulled. Yep. All no, right. None. We'll call a vote, please. Mr. Hoover? Yes. Mr. Ehrlich? Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mr. Range? Yes. Mr. Harlan Pudis? Yes. There's no unfinished business. Approval of vouchers. Will the clerk please read the voucher for us? In the current fund, $9,935,770.86. From the general capital fund, $330,664.99. From the electric operating fund, $846,431.40. From the electric capital fund, $82,545. From the water operating fund, $42,694.38. And from the trust, $15,784.17. The total is $11,253,890.80. Mayor, I move the vouchers. Second. Second. Any discussion? Roll call vote, please. Mr. Hoover? Yes. Ms. Ehrlich? Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mr. Range? Yes. Mr. Harlan Pudis? Yes. In the new business, I'd like to make the following appointment uh, requiring uh, council consent is Doug Willis of Rosedale Avenue to the Complete Streets Committee as a resident um, member uh, for a term through December 31st, 2023. May I have a motion? So moved. Uh, second. 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 All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Tom? Motion. Aye. Oh, no. Oh. Motion, for, uh, motion to adjourn. I'll make a motion to adjourn. <laughs> all, all in favor? Uh, Hi. Hi. <laughs> oh, uh, see, Sorry. I was, they, they wanted to end. It was so much fun.